We're on the air. Say that again now. No, I'm so going to give it to you. Yeah. Okay, this is Gregory, and I just recently re uh, did my driver's license above my signature line where I would sign my name. I printed Alt Rights Reserved Bill UCC Smith. 1308. And then you see you had your signature. So did you put Mr.? Uh, no, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that at that time. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll do mine uh, the way Patrick is suggesting. Yeah, and you mentioned that was on a computer screen you had assigned, so you squeezed it all in there. Yeah, cool. But now, do we, we take a photocopy of our... I've done my birth certificate, but you do your driver's license and your Social Security card, and... Uh, yeah. Send that to I think it's three three different places. Lars, can I, you hear? I think Greg, are you there? No, I guess he dropped out. I have to try to call after. I, I, I I'm, think I'm, I'm, I, I I just rebooted and uh, I'm getting the drop out on the internet here. Okay, Patrick, you're on. I think Patrick says whenever you're doing uh, any of your um, IDs, mm -hmm. that has to be done differently than um, than if we're doing the 1099A or the 1099C copies, A, B, and C. But the 1099B, that has to be done, I think, with your IDs. You know, driver's license, birth certificate, et cetera. I'm pretty sure, but did I drop out? No, I hear you. No, I hear you. Uh, okay. So you do right. think that's it. <clears throat> Are you there, Greg? Yes, I am. I got back. Okay. Yeah, evidently, you. there's an Internet problem between you and me. So you, if you drop out, you just get back. Well, I try to get back. It usually takes you to ring it back on me. So right, right. Anyway, did was there any further question on what I did? No, that was pretty good. I'm going to try it. Um, to do it on the 18th next Monday. <clears throat> you need to do some reading up on the bi colon uh, yeah, the, thing. The bi, yeah, the bi colon. Um, I think I remember um, it protects you. It, you're you're signing it for that name that I remember. Right. That's that makes you, you know, like like if it's a corporation, you'd be signing by, and you're the authorized signature, but you're not the responsible party. Right. Exactly. That's that's it. Yeah. And that's good. To I think know. it can, I think it can give them quite a headache if you want to push <laughs> it. Of course, I haven't had a traffic ticket go through in 20 or 30 years because I go down, read the statute, they uh, quote, and then I make copies of it. And when we go to court, I said, here's what I did. Here's what the statute says. I was in compliance with the statute. <laughs> Judge looks at it and says, oh, well, case dismissed. That's great. But, you know, the, you should charge them for your time. <laughs> yeah. So that was that, that was UCC one dash three oh eight, right? All right, Bill Smith. Correct. Okay, cool. I'm just writing it. I get mixed up with numbers, I'm a little dyslexic. Okay, cool. Well, it used to be uh one three oh one two oh seven yeah, but they moved it to three oh eight in order to hide it. Now mm -hmm. I wonder if it might really have some effect if they take it if they're going to the problem trouble of taking it from one section of the book and hiding it in another section so that we can't find it as easily. Gee. And uh, that's what was told to me. It's better to use just the words. Right. That way it doesn't make any difference where they put it. Yeah. Well, I don't know question. where it's going to be tomorrow. Yeah. So it's better to use without recourse instead of one that's No, with, uh, without prejudice. Without prejudice. I mean, without prejudice. Yeah. Yes. Why can't you just use authorized representative? It's different. Buy, buy is shorter. Well, yeah, that's a good point. 
Okay. You're very oh, soft. Did you guys record that? Well, uh, recording the conversation. Another, yeah. another okay. thought is that after you signed your nig uh, name, you put A period S period. That means authorized signature. Mm -hmm. So then they have to find out who authorized you to sign it, and who the responsible party is. They might have a might just have to just throw it out because it'd be too much trouble to go down that road. Mm -hmm. So A period S period authorized signature, We're, not authorized representative. Last time I got it, uh, my truck impounded, I just signed my name, you know, surname and then given name, like Patrick taught us, and I never got a summons to the court. I never got nothing from him. You mean you signed a ticket like that? Yeah. Signed it, you know, surname first and then given in middle. And I put, right. you know, under threats. And then I put a big, bo wrote a box around it, and I wrote non assumpsit in the corner. <laughs> it means no contract. So much, you know, I think there's so many ways. Good idea. Yeah. Because they don't, like Patrick said, they don't have, a corporation has no jurisdiction over a living man. And a corporation has to have a last name. If the last name doesn't match, then they can't do anything. Oh, you, did that on the, you did that on the summons then? No, I wrote it on the citation. And, yeah, that's and what I'm I saying. And I put a box around it too. The federal so style man you says put... anything in a box is not part of the page, so it's not a bona fide signature, it's not part of the page. So you box the name, but you put uh, uh, Stephen, your last name first. Correct. Oh, okay. And then I put non assumpsit in the top right. You put what in the top right? Non assumpsit. What does that mean? It means no contract. Look at Oh, up. that's that's a legal um, word. Look at that's up. Latin. Let me see it what... deletes their ability to make certain assumptions. Yes, it cannot be assumed, I believe is what it means. A non assumpsit. Okay. Well let me look it up easy enough to do. Well, I saw a case get dismissed. I knew somebody that um, got pulled over and he was, they accused him of like being under the influence of alcohol. I think he used alcohol to get sap off his car when he was washing a car. It might have absorbed through his fingertips or he could have, you know, whatever. I don't think the guy was drinking. But when he signed his driver's license and when he signed the ticket, he wrote non assumpsit where you put the signature. And it just said non assumpsit instead of a signature. Mm -hmm. So when the judge came to that, he dismissed the whole thing and sent the jury home. Mm -hmm. uh, non assumpsit is a general plea or denial in an action of assumpsit. <laughs> well, that's not defining anything. Hey, I wonder it if. It means we can no put... contract. Right. No contract, yeah. I wonder if we can put, <laughs> you know, how we have the addresses on the uh, license, our address. We can do the change and put without in front of the um, town. Uh, but when you do the application, they'll change it because they change it anyhow. Yeah, there's uh, just so much they can put in the box. That's why they gave me such a hard time saying um, they can't do it and they're not going to approve it. And I just said, well, I'm not leaving here until... <laughs> They won't even authorize the issuance of a license if you don't provide a social security number. They're saying we're not authorized to give you a license with it, without one. So they, you know, it's like, first of all, it wasn't supposed to be used for ID. Now you can't get a driver's license. So, really, you're not eligible to get a driver's yeah, license. If you look up the uh, federal law on that, you can tell them that asking you for your social security number is against federal law, would they like to tell that to the U.S. Marshals? Right. It's Title V, Section 11, I think. I'm pretty sure. Right. Yeah, but you like have a $1,000 fine each time they, they request it. Right. So you have to uh, read them. them the statute and, you know, say, look at them and say, how many times have you asked that today? Let's get the federal marshals down here and uh, have them check all your paperwork and how many. Uh, yeah, and get out your checkbook. 
Yeah. I just tell them now I'm not eligible for a license because I'm not going to provide a Social Security number. We're, you know, we're supposed to be killing that account anyhow with SS4s or, mm -hmm. you know, we're supposed to. Well, I think when we finally kill the driver's license, uh, I think Patrick has mentioned it uh, briefly, because mm -hmm. we need to, uh, when they turn it back into us, they, they give us a, a letter of exemption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when they broker it. Yeah. 1099B. Right. We turn it in with a 1099B? Yeah, or? just tell them, you know, you, you want them. You don't oh, want but you do You're a not copy. operating commercially. Right. Remember, the 1099B is a complete liquidation. Right. But the driver's license isn't commercial. It's only... They're all... They're considered... Two. No, everything is a security. Oh, yes, they're commercial. Look on the back of it. Oh, and okay. And you'll see that you do... That's what I signed up for, huh? You, even your voter registration card get, has this. Well, I'm going to have an awful lot of mailings this week. I'll tell you that. Okay. Yeah, now, they're I'm, foreign, I'm, and they I'm, got us to go ride their foreign horse. We're hopping on a foreign horse when you go to them. Now, I'm I'm on, on my stuff. Since I've got a lot to do, I'm going to send out some by faxes. That's and, what, uh, that would is, be good. There is a service uh, called Metrofax. Mm -hmm. It's nine. That's it's either nine or ten dollars a month. Okay. You can receive or send 150 pages it's in combination. And well, the way you do it is you you put in the phone number of the fax at metrofax.com. Okay. And you send it out from your account. You 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 have to you know you have to pay in first. Now, after 150 pages, it's three cents a page. And you can use multiple phone numbers doesn't have to be just one yeah you can do it in one email yeah okay. but uh, the thing is is I'm going to uh, when I did that for cer uh, certificate certificate notification of service on my, my bankruptcy case I had to address each email because when you send the email if you have any message in the email that becomes a cover sheet okay and then you attach any doc files or PDF files that you want to include now, with some of these things that we're sending, don't they need a hard copy, too, or no, not really, as long as they get the fax? Well, well the reason I'm sending the fax is that, I'm, especially in my case, I, I, uh, you know, you're basically notifying them. And that, that's the way Patrick did it uh, with his, uh, I think, his 250 k transfer of funds. He notified them by fax and said a hard mm -hmm. copy is on its way. Yeah. And you can do the fax right from your computer, right? Yes, but that's an email. Okay. Now, there is a program out there where if, if you have had a landline and you have a fax modem in your computer, you can do it. But I haven't been able, and I'm computer-oriented, I haven't been able to find it. Um. I have a so fax this, machine, but I don't even know how to run it. Well, if you have a fax machine, then then that's okay. If you don't know how to run it, then do it by <laughs> do it by email. You can get a free uh, e-fax account for receiving emails. Okay. So you you know just use the Metro fax for sending. That's better than um, going to the drugstore to fax things out. Sure, sure. You have a lot more control of what you're doing, mm -hmm. especially when you have to send out the, the same fax to a bunch of people. Right. It's well, exa this absolutely the same fax. You can put them all, you know, all in, all in the address line separated by, I believe it's a comma. And this would get some of the important things out right away, you know, yes. like I, I want to get my, some of the licenses out fast because those are important documents in that okay. affidavit, that affidavit letter. 
and then follow okay. it up with a hard copy. Well, I, it looks like Patrick may may not come. He did spend an awful lot of time with us last night. He did. And today's Veterans Day, correct? That's true, and he's a veteran. He may have um, doings going on today. Or he may just you know, take it, this is my day off. He certainly needs a day off. He's not taking very many. He, he does. Um, there was a kind of a slap in the Veterans Day by the fact that Hawaii allowed the arrival of Chinese troops today. No. Chinese troops arrived in Hawaii. That may be a good thing. Yeah. That's, uh, it may be in conjunction with what I was talking about yesterday. Yeah, I read the Benjamin Fulford um, thing. It was seemed sort of like what you were talking about. Yeah, it's in the, it's in, that's the, more or less what I'm talking about. Yeah. He's seeing it from a different angle. Right. Uh, Neil Keenan feeds him the information, and some sometimes Ben gets it wrong. But yeah, they're a, like forcing the United States to stop doing all this warmongering and say, hey, look, we want to like – be uh, helpful to the people on the planet and especially the needy people and start growing more right. food and get good clean water and better shelter and everything else. Well, if you really want to get the background detail on it, the, the, the long version is uh, at uh, David Wilcox's website, Divine okay. Cosmos. Okay. And Google for Divine Cosmos Financial Tyranny. Okay. And what it really amounts to is that the Chinese, mostly the Chinese, but Asia basically has 85% of the world's gold. Some of it is still underground. Divine purity? Financial. Pardon? Divine, oh, well, divine, divine, divine cosmos. Divine cosmos? Divine, and divine then cosmos. slash financial tyranny? No, 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 not slash. Just Google those four words. Oh, divine cosmos and financial tyranny. Yeah. Okay. It pops and up it, once it you should, put that. It should, come, it should come up with the uh, oh, trillion, I see the trillion dollar lawsuit that'll kill you know fix the fix the bastards or whatever it says. Yeah, Dr. Michael Vandermeer was the one that had a lot most of the gold holdings here in the United States. Yes, and Neil Keenan knew Dr. Vandermeer. Yeah. I used to talk to him too. Okay. So anyhow, what what they're saying is, you know, because most of what World War II was about was to to uh, say say to the Chinese, oh, the Japanese are going to come and steal all your gold, give it to us, and we'll protect it for you. Right. And then the, the Chinese did that with the agreement that they would be paid four percent interest per year, and they haven't been paid a damn thing. In fact, they threatened after a while, so. Basically, what Neil Keenan has is a lawsuit that that puts an end to all of that. And uh, the the East is not about to let the West run the money system anymore. Right, and they could be in Hawaii to collect the gold in some no, of the storage vaults there. They're they're actually here to help with the surprise. Okay. Now, isn't that supposed to take place on the 17th, or? Well, the New York Times announced it for the 13th. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, and they're saying, oh no, no power is going to be turned off. This is only a drill. You know, like all all of these other things, like uh, the LAX shooting and uh, the Boston Marathon. All of that was a drill too. Does this you have know, anything to do with home security having stacks and stacks of um, martial law signs? Uh, actually, it's to oppose that. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're getting kind of desperate. Yes. It turns out that with the liens that Neil Keenan put on the banks, that basically BIS is not cannot transfer funds anymore, and most of the European banks cannot transfer. So you hear all of these talks about bailouts in Europe, but they never happen because they can't tra transfer the money. Right, it's just monopoly money anyhow. Yeah, contaminated by the fact that probably 98% of it is worthless derivative stuff. 
Right. Well, between uh, Bush, Bush, you know Herbert Walker Bush, Clinton, and then George W. Bush and Obama, they've they've already milked or skimmed fifty or sixty trillion dollars, and if they couldn't get the economy going with that, then nothing's will. Hmm. They just pocketed all that money. Well, well, they didn't. They even, you know, they never intended to use it to get the economy going. They just said that's what they were doing. And they called those funds TARP funds. Okay. Remember? Now, uh, I'm, I'm looking at his new 1099V. Okay. And uh, right in the middle box, there's the word Curtan. Yes. I look, uh, Anderson doesn't have that word. So uh, do we have Oxford? Do we? Uh, well, I don't have Oxford. There was a site, somebody, one of the members emailed me that you could download any any book. Um, and then the other, other thing I noticed was graven debt down in the box in the bottom. These are all new words. Yes. Okay, now, Patrick, and I'm hey on the Patrick. line. Yes, hi, <laughs> Patrick. Graven is not a new word, okay? Okay. You may think that it is new, but it's not, okay? It's in the second commandment. Thou shalt have no graven images. Yes. What have you done? You have created a graven image in the form of this Social Security person. It's a dead person. It's uh -huh. a grave image of you. That's what they've done. Mm -hmm. Okay, to use usury. That's against the Bible, too. And this is supposed to be a Christian country. Now, the only Christian country that's really out there is Syria. Hmm. And they want to annihilate them. Yeah, well. Yeah. The de definition I looked up for graven image is an object such as a statue that is worshipped as a god or in place of a god. And you can certainly say that's the way we treat dead as a, as a god. Yeah. And basically, graven debt. Basically, it's a dead debt. It's it's a hidden behind. Okay. There are several things in in this process that uh, uh, are out there. Is uh, uh, you can look up the word graven. You can look up the word wizard. Okay. You can look up M A G U S, magus. You won't find Magi, it refers to Magus, and that's in uh, Oxford. And Magicians of the Curtain, okay? That's basically what these guys are. They're magicians. They're pharaohs. They're, they're operating a pharaonic system of deception. Okay? It's all a false debt. It's not really a debt. But it's a false debt out here. But they've got everybody in this country believing. The credit's there, okay? But they've got everybody locked up and keeping the credits from the people and then putting a false sense of debt on there. And then it's hidden behind the curtain, a paper curtain, a paper deck curtain. Okay. I, I noticed that in in that box you actually uh, misspelled curtain. It came out curtain. C U R T A I N, right? Yes. You, you don't have the I in it. 
So I looked yeah. in Anderson to see what is this another word I don't know, and I couldn't find it in Anderson's. I thought I had it spelled right. Yeah, there's room. The there's room enough for it. Up, okay, but uh, oh, it's such a small deal. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're we're looking at it closely though. Well, I think I posted you one up this afternoon, didn't I? You sent it to me at 6.30, and I got it up on the site. No, you sent it to yeah. me at 5.45, and I had it up on the site at 6.30. Yeah. I may spell curtain in there? Yeah. In the latest one? Yeah. It's easy enough to fix. The, the one the other day, I, let me see, where in the hell is it? I mean, we can fix it ourselves. Yeah, but... It's a fillable field. Oh, up there at the very top. Yeah. Yes, per attached 1099A. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, see, everything's a, a false curtain, okay? Just like in the movie Wizard of Oz, okay? It's a curtain hidden behind the curtain by the wizards. Our debts uh, are fiction, and then they see that our credits are hidden behind the curtain of a fictional debt. See, everything on the other side of the looking glass is the mirror image. Like I told you the other day, yesterday, is that they see the uh, Social Security account and the uh, certificate of live birth are like a checking in a savings account. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, you utilize the checking account and then it will draw against the savings account if you have an overdraft. Right. But in their world, you're using the savings account and it will be a draw against the checking account, the mirror image. The checking account is the certificate of live birth, which they don't, they've got hidden behind the curtain because you don't see it. You can go in and write a check out to pay for the thing using your assets in the, in the certificate of live birth account. The savings account is the Social Security account. You don't need the savings account. What are you saving for? For the uh, president to steal. Yeah, you're basically, the only thing that a savings account does is use usury in total violation of the Bible. Everybody thinks they've got to uh, get out here and play the market, speculate, be like everybody else. Yeah. But what are you trying to be like? The devil. The deceivers. You've got the assets of America at your fingertips. You're a shareholder in America. Use it wisely. This country is the richest country in the world. Okay, now, uh, I was going to go over uh, the 1099 uh, C's and the A's. Good. Okay. I want everybody to have a form in front of them. Just a second. Okay. And then write this stuff down, okay, as I go through it. Okay, i got to pull it up. Is it the new C or the? It's There's probably only one 1099C, a, 19, a 2013, pulled off the IRS website, right. okay? And prob you probably should, by now, you should have had some ordered. They're not in yet. Well, 
do the file of a few days ago, 1099A-C-V transfer of funds. It has all on one piece of paper. Um, okay. Doesn't make any difference. New one right. or old one, whatever. Okay. Okay. The okay. blocks are all the same. Okay. Yeah. You've got creditor. Okay. Who's the creditor in uh, all, that needs to have a form applied to it? The creditor is your bankrupt. Okay. So the creditor is going to be like. Mr. or uh, Patrick Divine deceased. I've got an EIN. Now, if you've got an EIN uh, for the estate, you should have gotten a letter from the IRS when you got that EIN. They told you what needed to go on to the forms. Okay, how it was supposed to be. Okay, so it's Patrick Devine, uh, a deceased. That's what they sent me also, a 1096 form with this all printed on there. Uh, I don't know whether too many people got that back, but I know several people besides me got one back from the IRS with that laid out. Because the machines look for what has been inputted into them. And this is what was inputted into for your estate EIN. Now, for your, if you uh, don't have an EIN, then basically you can put down your Social Security person, okay, which would be just like Patrick Devine. Now, and this should I be all capital letters, shouldn't it, if it's the estate deceased person? You can put it in all capital letters, okay? Okay. Yes, you have that as the debtor on the C. No, the credit, I'm the telling you. I'm, He's you correcting just listen it. to me and fill it out the way I tell you to, okay? He's correcting okay. it. Okay. You're doing the creditor. You're starting at the top and working okay. your way down the left-hand side. Okay? okay? So it's Patrick Devine deceased. Then on my form, I had uh, Patrick Devine executor. Then I had the street address. And then it had Sigourney, Iowa. And basically, then it's also would be, uh, since they want the state, province or state, in there you would put U.S., and then you would put the zip code, and mine is 52591, and then dash 8236. They had that all in the form. Then you put your phone number. Now, the creditor's federal identification number is going to be that zip code, the post office, plus the four-digit box number. This is a banking instrument. That zip code with the four-digit number is an ABA bank routing number. Because that five-digit dash the four-digit is a depository bank mailbox, okay? You receive mail in that mailbox every day. And mail is money. You're getting a stamp in there. And you can claim that value of that stamp. You just didn't know you could, okay? So you've been throwing money away right and left. Now, that's the creditor's federal identification number. The debtor's identification number, depending on 
who it is. It can either be uh, the Social Security number. It can either be the uh, EIN number, or it can be an, another number, but it's a nine-digit bank routing number. What I have on this sheet that I'm looking at here is my driver's license number. That's the debtor's identification number. Hmm. The debtor is going to be, in this case, Keokuk County Clerk of the Court, care of the Iowa 8th Judicial District Department of Correctional Services. This is for a traffic ticket. You would turn around and put, like a utility company, and they see they've got an an account number there with that utility. So you would put the account number, or if uh, it doesn't come up right, you would put down their depository number in there, their zip code, dash their four-digit number. Like when I did one with the uh, General Motors Corporation, CFO. He has a mailbox depository, a bank depository number. So I put down his zip code plus his four-digit number. Why that one instead of an EIN number? Well, basically because uh, that financial manager or that chief financial manager, CFO, uh, officer, is probably over quite a few different EINs. But they all go to him in the same mail depository, hmm. the same bank number. And you put down the street address and the town, city, state, country, zip code, and then the account number. Now, for uh, the one that I have here, the clerk of the court is going to be Iowa citation number, the receipt number of that ticket. That's the account number that we're going after on this uh, cancellation of debt here. If you have a utility bill, it would be the billing number, the receipt number. That's the account number. If you're trying to get a new vehicle, that would be the VIN number of the window sticker receipt that you have. Hmm. Now, does anybody have any problems so far? I, no, I, I, I thought that makes sense. No, Tom, I'm I asking just, other people, okay? Okay. I just have one question that I get confused on. When you say the zip code plus four, are you talking about when you look it up on zip plus four, are you talking about a 999 or a 998? No, number? I'm talking about your delivery address. No, I'm, the, well. The federal, the uh, Delivery address for the chief financial officer. You find out what the corporate headquarters okay. zip code is, and then you should, you might have to look around until you find out uh, what the four digit number is okay. that they have for that corporate headquarters. Okay. Okay, I understand that. For the zip plus four, you can go to the CFO is at, 
not the local Ma and Pa uh, store. You're not sending it back to them. You're going to the headquarters. You need to go to the headwaters. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? No other. Yeah, yeah, we got a question, Pastor. What? We got a question. Okay, ask it. I have uh, a company that doesn't have a CFO, but only they got a supervisor. What kind of So how do how do I find that 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 out? What company are you talking about? Uh, collection agency. That collection agency is a third party debt collector. What are you dealing with them for? You're supposed to be dealing with the first party. You don't have a contract with the third party debt collector, do you? No. Okay. They took over the bill. So you go and set the debt off with the first party. That third party is a uh, is not the person you need to deal with. All right. Thank you. You tell them, bring it to court. If you've got a claim, a legitimate claim, you take me to court. But you don't have a contract with that third party debt collector. See, you need to start understanding who you really are and who you're dealing with. You didn't have a contract with a third-party debt collector. That main corporation is the one you need to go after. That's the debt that you need to cancel. You have 30 days when you get a re uh, something in the mail from a third party, and all you do is send something in and say, um, um, we don't have a contract, and you get rid of them, and they leave. Right. See, they turn around, and basically, in most cases, the thing has already been settled, okay? Yeah. Mm. And then they turn around. The main corporation turns around and sells it to this third-party debt collector for pennies on the dollar. They're trying to get an extra payment out of somebody, and then basically the third-party debt collectors, which in a lot of cases are attorneys out there trying to pad their pocketbooks, they pick these things up, and they're trying to make a 1,000% profit on their investment. Mm -hmm. But if you don't respond to it, they can take a judgment out after you. So you yes, have to but then you have to know how to fight the judgment. Correct. Okay? Correct. And see, okay, that's what everybody's question. been fighting it the wrong way out here and not knowing uh, what the situation is. You still need to cancel the debt back at the main headquarters mm -hmm. because it has never been brought into full closure or a full receipt. I said this about a week or so ago uh, about the definition of receipt. And there's a full receipt or receipt in full in the dictionary. And that is one that is brought into full closure. Just like your traffic tickets at uh, uh, you get. Why is the insurance company uh, able to keep your rates up high for three years? Because the traffic tickets have never been fully gone into receipt in full. Even though you paid the ticket out of your back pocket, that was not canceling the debt.
you only gave that payment to them, and they're utilizing that payment as a profit because they've got bonds written against the other side. Okay? And basically the charges, and in most cases, were all fraudulent to begin with. See, as, as you are the living, you need to put without in front of your city, state, country, and zip code. You use the word without. In my case, Sigourney, Iowa, USA, and then the zip code. That means that those uh, corporate entities do not have jurisdiction. And the, figure, uh, the city, okay, you look it up in uh, Anderson's, and I think it was also in uh, uh, Oxford Universal Dictionary, a city is under the jurisdiction of the bishops because what have they got most of the people in the cities classified as dead entities it's a citeria a cemetery so the bishop and this was out of, in England the bishops had control of the cities under ecclesiastical law, the dead laws of the dead. And they've done the same thing with the state corporations and the country corporations. So when you put without that means that you are not under their jurisdiction and you're coming into the city, the state, or the country as a visitor. You're visiting that cemetery. You don't need to put the outlying islands out there. The word without stands out as the key word. Now, do we use without in what in the creditor portion? No. No, okay. The creditor is assigned that dead entity. He's dead. He's deceased. Okay. He's your grave at uh, graven image, okay? For right now, he's the debtor to you, the living. You as the living are the one that has, that is not within their jurisdiction. So on that ID that I had made up before, you need to put down uh, without. You need to have your W-8 form filled out with the word without in front of your city. Okay. Your, your uh, address, you put care of in front of it, C-O. Now you have your exemption form filled out right, but you have to have your name filled out in the living as Mr. or Mrs dot, and then your living name, your birthing name, and then semicolon, then your dead lineage name, your clan name. And then you can put a colon after that and put a title if you have one. And if you're over the age of 25, you should have an A-P-E-O, 
American Principal Executive Officer. We're supposed to be the American Principal Executive Officers over all of these corporations. I put up a document there before about the four crowns of America. The head crown is the people, the living land. That's the number one crown. The second crown is the land and basically authority. The land supports the people, the living land above ground. And that's the crown of the state or the land. The third crown is the crown of uh, commonwealth and that has the next superiority because everybody, all the people that are under that crown are operating in agreement, total agreement. The only ones that would probably fit into that category are the uh, fruitcake religious organizations to where they all follow some nitwit uh, leader out there thinking that he knows everything and they've signed on to it in agreement. And they will die following that nitwit. So you should never see a commonwealth crown. because I don't think you could ever get anybody into total agreement. Everybody has a different level of knowledge out there, so basically they would never, you would never have total agreement. The last and final crown in America is the crown of government. And they're supposed to be a supportive caste to we the people. That means they are down below we the people. But they've tried to assert their crown and bring it up by creating these fictional dead people that we have. And then basically when you die, what do you do? You revert back to the state. You go back into the land so that these government agencies are trying to claim that you're dead and they're coming in and protecting the state. That's why in all court cases, it's always you versus the state, not you versus the government. Okay. Does anybody have any questions so far now? Patrick, it's Gita. I have a question. Um, yeah, go ahead. So let's see. The creditor is me, and I would use, they gave me an EIN number. So the same name that they wrote down uh, with the, um, the stuff they sent me back with the new EIN number. I have to put that same exact name and address in the creditor's box. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Read okay. that letter that you got back from the IRS with that EIN number. It yeah. tells you right on there, use it, use this uh, name exactly. and address and everything on your forms. Yeah, exactly as it is, as how they typed it out. Okay, yes. second. Uh, the creditor's uh, federal uh, identification number would be my zip code plus my four digits. That is your that is your fictional person, your estate federal identification number. Right, F I N. Not your zip, not your E I N. 
Okay. No, no, the zip code. Yeah, with the four. Okay, yeah. I am going to do Wells Fargo, right? Say, um, I would have to get the CFO of Wells Fargo, or do I have to use the address from the bill uh, invoice that they have given me? Is it a mortgage? No, it's just credit card that I paid. Okay, I they, paid they, off. yeah, you would go after the CFO of Wells Fargo. Yeah, and you I would do. find out that their uh, delivery mailbox number, their bank depository number. Okay, that would be the de the debtor's um, ID number, identification number. That would be their zip code and the four digits to the yes. CFO of the corporate uh, headquarters of uh, Wells Fargo, and that would be all that information would be in the debtor's. And then the account number is going to be the account number of my credit card. Yes, and they yes. Okay. in that case. Uh, yeah. If um, you want do you think to protect that, do you think okay, if you want to protect that, uh, uh -huh. you would just put down the last four digits of that number. Oh, so they won't cancel it. Huh? They might cancel it if I put the whole number down or just put the last four? No, basically. You're Security. putting this information out, and somebody else might see it. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Identity theft. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay, cool. That's 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 that's. Uh, they know. They when you send this in, okay. Now the IRS is basically going to primarily look at uh, the creditor account. Uh, the numbers and the two mm -hmm. bank routing numbers. Okay, they're not going to look necessarily at the account number down below. Gotcha. That is primarily for uh, when you send the B copy to the debtor. They will identify that account number that they have under their jurisdiction. So when you when I send the B copy, the the whole number will need to be on there. Got it. No. 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 They've got your name and address. They've got your bank routing number and everything else on their books. When you sign up for that credit card, you gave them your name. You gave them your Social Security. You gave them an address, a mailbox for them to send. And when you look at your receipt that you get from them. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. it's got your five-digit uh, post office and your four-digit box number on it. Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, so, and then uh, all you have to do is just charge that amount of debt on there. You endorse the bill, and basically oh. you send it back to them. And with the 1099-C to discharge that amount of debt. I have to endorse each one of them. Uh, do I have to add them? Um, uh, you were saying something that we should do one per item, or can I do all of them for the year and add it up? Well, you should do it on a monthly basis. Okay. On a monthly basis, uh, I, I collect. Yeah, a, you a, get a form. you get a statement from the credit card company, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And basically, you endorse that one. Now, basically, for uh, if you still got one outstanding, uh, you cancel that one right now, okay? It may include two or three months on it because you haven't paid for two or three months, so you just endorse the last one that you've received and cancel all that debt that they're claiming you owe. Oh. No, I, I paid it all, all out of pocket. I already paid okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Then you can turn around and you can come back at them because, see, they borrowed against your, uh, against the treasury. In a lot of cases, like credit cards, uh, from what I understand, they borrowed like two million dollars uh, assets per person, mm -hmm. and then write bonds on that for a short duration time period. 
So the bill is already prepaid. Yeah. Okay, the money is sitting there. All you have to do is cancel the debt that they owe back to the treasury. Okay, See, so most I'm gonna... of the stuff, most of the yeah. stuff that they borrowed, they're using for operating expenses, and otherwise it will be paid back to the treasury. The profit that the corporations, the oil companies, and everything else are getting is when you pay out of your back pocket. They've already got the, the operating expenses covered from the usury of your assets. So now when you pay out of the back pocket, then you're now giving them their profit for the year. And it's going to be, at the end of the year, given over to the shareholders out there. It's abandoned property. It's sitting there until basically the shareholders get a claim to it. So you have to come back in there and put a claim back, and that's where you put down the value uh, and uh, you either put a 1099A in to claim the prepayment, the double payment that is there, back. Now, since this, if it's paying a bill by this bondage system, instead of outright payment, then you get the money back payment, then you're going to have to pay the usury tax on that, and that's when uh, you would have to pay the income tax, the 1040 uh, taxes. So when you cancel the debt, then basically that's going to say that basically uh, it is you got a benefit from that. You weren't necessarily paying it out of your checking account, your certificate of live birth of real assets. You are using the savings account. And the savings account you have to pay uh, to the 1040 form on to pay the payment. But see, in most cases, you've never been given the money, the benefit, out of it. They've kept the benefit from you. In the form that they write bills in the state legislature. And they're utilizing your assets out there under the voter registration card. And you haven't contested, hey, I didn't I didn't receive a damn benefit from that bill you passed out here. Property taxes. Okay? The biggest majority of taxes on property is school taxes. In a lot of cases, the vast majority of people in this country, it, their kids are either above age of school age, so now you, they, those people aren't receiving any benefit of the school. And if you are married and don't have any kids, you're definitely not getting any benefit from the school taxes. So you can claim those school taxes back. Then you would have the money, you would have to offset that money that you made that was income to you. Now you would file that onto your 1040 form and pay the, the usury tax on that 
money that you got back. This is an accounting nightmare. You've got to really think this process through, okay? You need to sit down and go through the item. In this country, you do not have to pay for services that were never rendered to you. But they've got everybody out here believing that they're obligated to take any and all services. No, you don't have to. If you don't receive a benefit of that service, it's not a service to you. Now on the 1099-C, you put down the date you identify this event. So you normally try and get those things turned back around uh, within the three-day time frame or the 30-day time frame out here. You, in most cases, your utilities and everything else, you've got a 30-day window to try and get them to turn around back to them before the next bill comes out. So we would do the um, the B uh, monthly, but the 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 black copy, but the red copy we can do um, we can accumulate that and do it in a like a bulk. The A well, copy. Well, you you fill out yes. all three copies, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that you only have to send in the A copy in. Uh, periodically into the IRS that you send you tear the C or the B copy off mm -hmm. separate it off and then send that to along with the uh, receipt endorsed receipt back to the utility company or to whoever right with the V attached yeah and then put the 1099 B you use the 1099 B as a voucher to claim the asset, and you put that chief financial officer down as the vouchee, the one that is now obligated to see that brought into fulfillment. The treasurer of the county or the clerk of the court. Oh. Yeah, you make them the vouchee. You make it the office, not the individual. You mm -hmm. make it the office is the one that is liable for being the vouchee. Um, Patrick, this is Pat. I have a question. Okay. If if you have you fill out the 1099C for your claim or your cancellation of debt. And you also need to fill out the 1099A for funds that you had paid in. Um, do you add those two figures to put in to your voucher? No, no. You're canceling the debt. Uh, okay, let's go over to the other side, to the right-hand side. Okay, we've got the date that it was identified. Okay. Tell me the date of the bill. The amount of the debt to be discharged is going to be uh, the billing amount. Now, if they have interest, uh, if you've been uh, behind or something like that, they've added interest. Right. Okay? So that is interest that is uh, due uh, to that account. So they will have that list. So you would put that down. In most cases, it's going to be zero. Then you have the debt description, uh, the bill payment, and also if you've made a secondary payment, you could uh, say that uh, this was paid out of back pocket also in the debt description. Okay. Then on block five, you would, if you had made a secondary payment, you would 
put a check there that the debtor is liable for the repayment of the debt. Okay. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just doing it a straight set-off. So only if you've got something coming back is going to be the debtor is going to be personally liable for the repayment because now they have a double debt. You're canceling one part of the debt, but they still have another debt that's on their books. That they that they owe you. That they owe you. And that in that case you would put a check mark there and then you would put the fair market value of the property that is owed back to you, the debt that is owed back to you mm -hmm. in block seven. Or you turn around and you leave four, five, and seven blank, and then you do another, you do a 1099A at that point in time, and your debtor person, your bankrupt, uh, like uh, Patrick Devine, deceased, estate, okay, is going to be uh, the lender on the 1099A. Yeah, he's going to be the lender. And then the borrower is going to be uh, the utility company or whoever you made the payment to. And see, you made the payment. That payment is now abandoned property until the end of the year when now it is claimed by the shareholders of that corporation. What if it, you, this, is for, this is for taxes. Um, we have outstanding taxes, but then there's quite a bit that were paid. So there's no way of you getting... You would be able to claim them back. Okay. You claim just, back everything out of the back pocket, okay? Right. So you paid out of your back pocket. Everything was supposed to be prepaid in this system that they set up. And see, that's why you have to try and get a handle on this accounting system here that they're operating with. Mm -hmm. And see, nobody out here, all these other gurus and everything, never really had a proper understanding of the accounting system. They thought they did, but they never did. So it's then, all in, in accounting, and it's a confusing accounting system. You have to really sit down and think this thing out. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so if I um, I put the figure for what I owe, my debtor owes in the C form and then what I'm claiming to have returned in the A form, um, then in the voucher, the um, the amount from the A form must go into the voucher, correct? Yes. Okay. That's all right. Good. And when you're yeah. claiming taxes back, you can only do it for the current year or can you go back to previous years? You can go back. There is no statute of limitation upon Against fraud. Against fraud, right, right. Okay. okay. I'm only going to do one year at a time. This is a fraudulent accounting system. This whole system is based upon uh, the Magi, okay, the Mangus, M-A-G-U-S, the fraud of the bankers hiding behind the curtain. Patrick? Yeah. Patrick? 
Yeah, this is, this is Marshall. Uh, if we're going back into another year, um, I'm only bringing this up because I was asked this when I went to the IRS office, even though they didn't have the form. They were asking me for the year. I'm wondering do we need to get the form for that year that we're claiming then maybe? No. No? Still use no. the current form. You use the current year form. You're filing it this year. You're not filing it that year. But you okay. put down the description of what uh, the year. And they see uh, I've got uh, seven different uh, ones from the IRS. Okay. Uh, one was for uh, 2008, 2007, 2005, 2006. Then they stuck one in there that goes all the way back to uh, 1992. Wow. That's over 22 years ago. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I remember you talking about this on another call. Go ahead. Yeah. So, see, I sent them all in uh, that way. Now, I messed up, and the when I filled the forms out, so I need to make a correction to the form, but I haven't sent the red copy in yet, so all I'll do is send a corrected B copy over to uh, the, and I'm just going to uh, fill out the form, the corrected one, and then on the B copy, I'm just going to put uh, check the box corrected. I don't need to do that on the A copy because uh, they haven't, I'm not correcting anything with them. They haven't gotten it into the system, but I will correct it with the uh, with the other IRS office when I submit it in, when I send them the updated uh, B copy to correct the address or whatever on the form. And see, these machines, Okay, why are these forms in red? Because they're all scanned into the machine. They're not inputted by a person. Okay, so it's the machine world that basically is in control, just like in the movie Matrix. The machine world had gotten out of control. And basically, the Mr. Smith in the movie was the money changers. They have totally gotten out of control from the original intent of what that machine was supposed to be doing. They've started branching out into everything and everywhere out here. The Social Security system was never supposed to go against the farmers in this country, the, the tillers of the land. The whole Social Security system was, uh, with this bankrupt system, was to be for the manufacturers in the cities. But since nobody out here basically said, hey, I am not under the jurisdiction of a city. They claim that they were under the jurisdiction of the city by acquiescence, by presumption. So the bankers and uh, the courts and the uh, bishops and everybody else out here, the merchants of deception, the magi, have assumed that everybody is living in a city because you have not broken that presumption. Even if you are in the city, you are not a city resident. You are not under the bishop's ceteria uh, or cemetery control. You are an American and you are a foreigner even though you're living, you're visiting that city because basically 
a human being can be anywhere, okay? You're not tied down. Only a dead human being is in a fixed position. So you are always without the city, without giving them the jurisdiction of being dead. That's when we're referring to the living. But you're saying here with the creditor, we're referring to the dead. Did I the hear you dead correctly? is dead, okay? He's dead. Yep, yep, okay. okay. But you, as the living, okay, are see, all dead. these codes and everything are written for the dead. They're not written for the living. Yep. They're written for the bankrupt or the debtor, your debtor, dead person. I think that's where we're getting confused is we've got to remember, like you said last night, we're living in two worlds. Yeah. And like you're saying, on this form here, we're, we're talking about the dead. And when we're talking about the living, then we use the without in front of the city and all the, the rest of the procedure there. That's correct. Okay. Okay. And that's why you need to have your W-8 form. So when they haul you into court or something like that, you are, you have, you're not under their jurisdiction. You're coming in as an outsider. You're making a visitation to that cemetery. I've been so damn close on all this stuff. Like I said, you walk into the courtroom. They have those little gates there that you have to go into the bar. Mm -hmm. They're like the cemetery gates when you go into the cemetery. Mm -hmm. They close those gates up at night at some cemeteries. Mm -hmm. Well, they do the same thing at the court. They close those little gates up. And see, they can only deal with the dead. And you're just coming in there as a visitor to give them uh, what they need to cancel the debt. You're the parole officer. You're the principal executive officer to issue the parole, P-A-R-O-L, without an E, for your debtor person. You're paroling that debt. There's a lot of terms that basically apply to this. The graven debt, and basically uh, you're paroling that out. That instrument, that receipt. And see, if you paid a receipt like at Walmart, okay, you collect all the receipts. You paid for them out of your back pocket. Okay? You do a 1099-C against the chief financial officer of Walmart. Okay? Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, you will see uh, the store number on uh, the receipt. And in a lot of cases, uh, and I saw this very prominent at the post office, is that they have a cash register number on the receipt. That is the account number that you're going after. Okay? The cash register Okay, with that post office or that uh, Walmart store, and then the individual uh, receipt number. 
and you can do those, uh, put those down on a, uh, an invoice against that cash register. You add up all the individual receipts. You list those by number, and then you endorse each one of those receipts, add them all up, and you put it in, and, they, and you should try and do that. Uh, they say that it should be over $600 when you send one of these 1099Cs in. See, they're telling us some of this stuff in the instructions that people didn't see. Why? Why the six hundred dollars? Well, that's because you hold that until you get six hundred dollars worth of receipts from Walmart. Then you submit one in against them. Now it's coming down to the time to where it's getting. The end of the year, uh, you uh, need to go in and submit it in before they transfer the funds over to the shareholders. Because you're coming in and canceling the debt, and then you're going to claim back in line seven what you paid out of your back pocket. Then you get your money back out of your back pocket. Now you have the money to pay the taxes or the benefit that you got from the product you got out of Walmart. But see, right now they've got us into a scenario to where we're paying the taxes and we're not getting our money back. And that's what I told the Attorney General about three years ago, my State Attorney General. I said, I'll be glad to pay the taxes when I get paid. And I didn't see it. I was trying to work with the 1099 A's and C's but I didn't see that the federal identification number was our depository bank number. We never filled out the 1099-Cs and A's properly when I was trying to do those uh, four years ago because we were trying to use the Social Security number or the Certificate of Live Birth number as our bank routing number. But it's the zip code that we're using rather than... It's the federal identification. It's our depository bank. Right. We've got to our get the funds transmitted to our bank. And see, that... Federal zone number is on the books. It's attached also to the Social Security number and to the Certificate of Live Birth number. The machines have you tracked in every which way possible. Hmm. And that's why if you don't fill out the things right, and put the right punctuations in, uh, when you submit the forms in, the machine will reject it. Even when you send it in to the CFO, if it's not uh, submitted into that 1099 uh, C or B, or A, copies are not filled out appropriately, they're not going to make the entry right. See, 
when we went to the uh, bishops to try and get our Sesta K trust from them at uh, New York. We didn't put down without our city and state and country. Hmm. By not having that without on that, that means that we were still under their jurisdictional control. So they could still hang on to that Sesta K account. So we weren't properly identifying ourselves then. We weren't properly identifying ourselves that we were not under their jurisdiction, the foreigner. Now some people have sort of walked out in uh, utilizing that uh, outlying island scenario and gotten some stuff out of there with them. But uh, for the most part, uh, that is uh, too much too wordage. And if you just put without, that definition is right in the dictionary of there. That's what I'm saying. You need to look up these words. You have to do this because you can't just listen to this audio and the audios, the other ones that I've put out here, and get it ingrained into your mind. Okay? That's where it needs to be centered, is put into your mind's eye. And until you actually pull up the dictionary, see the words in writing, read the words in writing, and then listen to the words from somebody, then you have the three sources that basically put that ingrained into your mind, into your mind's eye. Okay? Everything operates in threes. Utilize all three. Then you can get an understanding. Then you can, and that's the definition of can, the word can, is one who has knowledge. Now he can do something. But until you have the knowledge, you're just out there, uh, sort of like the machines, running them up. Hmm. You think you've got the knowledge, but basically you haven't read the instructions to have the knowledge. So sort of like some people go out and buy a new car. And they think, well, I operated a car last year uh, or 10 years ago, and basically this is no different. It's still a car. And lo and behold, they get down the road and something goes haywire because they didn't read the instructions. Something new was added to that car that basically automatically shut it down. Simple logic, okay, applies to a lot of this stuff. That's it. I found yeah. it quite interesting. You refer to the Matrix a lot, and we got the movie and, uh, and viewed it again, and it was a whole different viewing than when I first seen it the first time. And my wife we didn't have any other dictionary, but we had Black's Law Dictionary. And she looked up in there, and it had Matrix in there. I didn't find it in Anderson. 
but it's very interesting what matrix is stated in the Black Law Dictionary. Mm -hmm. And very you'll find a slightly different definition if you can go out and get a, a, a Oxford Universal or an old Webster uh, dictionary out here. Uh, in a lot of cases, pre 1930s uh, scenario, because in a lot of cases, the, the law dictionaries uh, have polluted a lot of these words and uh, out in, that are different, and in some cases, almost 180 out from what, uh, because there again, you're operating on the other side of a looking glass. So a lot of the law dictionaries are going to be on the uh, opposite side of the looking glass out here. And what are words? They are babble, okay? They're the deception. Language of babble. The Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. See, none of this stuff is new. It's all been played out previously. And that's why if you want to start looking at this stuff, now you can start going back and looking and understanding a lot of the parables and the different stories in the Bible. Most definitely. But one of the key things there in the movie Matrix was where Neil and the old uh, head guy, okay, that was on the council, they went down to the lower levels, and uh, they were sitting there looking at the machines that were down there. And the older guy that was from the council said, I don't know how this machine works, but I know we need to have it. It's for our benefit. And it was the water plant. He didn't know how it did its job, but he knew that it had to be there. And there are certain machines out here that we need, we put in place for our benefit that essentially we need to have operating out here but we need to be able to control them. I mean, it's like uh, I'm going to take one piece of equipment that basically is very can be very destructive, can be very useful, a caterpillar. You go out and you start the caterpillar up. You raise the blade up, and then you jump off of that caterpillar. You've got it in gear. And basically, before that caterpillar comes to a dead stop, it can do one hell of a lot of destruction. And that's what we've done. We've jumped off the caterpillar and allowed it to run amok. We were supposed to be the controllers of this thing. So you need to spend the time, okay? And like at the end of the movie Matrix, when the architect was talking to uh, the oracle, and she asked him, what about the others? And he said, they can come out if they want to. But they have to have the knowledge and understanding of what they're doing when they come out. If you haven't taken the time, you're going to basically be your own worst enemy. Yes, this is hard, okay? You've got to be able to give something up to gain the knowledge. Okay? You need to sit down and read the instructions. 
You need to stop and concentrate on getting the accounting book straight. Put aside going to the uh, midnight bowling league or something like that. Say, that's not going to do a damn thing for me. Or the going out with the girls and sitting there gabbing about something that basically has no relevancy whatsoever out here in the real world. It's just garbage. Or going down and sitting in a bar and drinking uh, yourself into oblivion. That isn't accomplishing anything either. That's it. Yeah. Shouldn't uh, uh well I have two questions. Shouldn't the uh form shouldn't the fifty sixes be changed to the to the to the new APO as well? A P E O? Yes. Basically, I would uh, get those filled out. Also, uh, put uh, down your executive uh, position, uh, your address and everything if it's on there. But uh, the key one is uh, to get that W-8 filled out. And then you submit the W-8 uh, in with most of your bills as the living. Okay. My, okay. Second question, my second question was about the 1099-V. The, yeah. the previous ones you did, they all of them were kind of different from each other. Is, is, is this latest one you, you use, is that specifically for us to use now, or is that just to use for the uh, certificate of live birth and the Social Security account? It's, it's to be used against... Uh, anything you're claiming, okay, I tried to make it uh, out there, you put the vouch E down of whoever uh, that uh, office is that is the debtor, okay. Now, I didn't cover the one to where you could come in as uh, the creditor as in the living you can fill in your everything on as the living. And you would put down care of uh, your address and then uh, without your uh, city and state and your creditor mailed uh, federal ID number is going to be the same. See, both basically your debtor and you received the mail in the same mail depository box. Now, the debtor, okay, when you put yourself down as the living and you're going to go in and cancel debt, your debtor person is going to be, like in my case, Patrick Devine, uh, deceased or estate uh, in the process as the debtor's name. Now, I'm going at that point in time to make it in care of the Secretary of the Treasury because I'm going after his other address that he has. See, he has two addresses. He's located with you, and then he's also located at where his account is located. And that would be at 1500 Pennsylvania Avenue, Penitentiary Row, Washington, D.C. And that's when he's the debtor? That's when you're doing a discharge a cancellation of debt against him. Okay. Yeah. So you can't cancel a debt that he is in your own household because the account is not there. 
you've got to go and cancel the debt that they see he is holding back at the Treasury. That's where the debt is at that he has. At that point in time, then you would, at the account number, okay, you would put down, like, uh, lose uh, debtor's identification number, which would be uh, 20220 dash and I'm going to say that uh, Luz, as he is the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, his uh, delivery number is 00, let me see, 0001, because he was the first office that was created in the Treasury, was the Secretary of the Treasury, so he's mm -hmm. got to have the number one position. at that delivery address and see that zip code strictly applies to uh, that 1500 Pennsylvania Avenue building that is a post office in itself as most major corporations uh, their buildings uh, all have individual zip codes five-digit uh, zip codes and then they have four-digit box numbers with inside that building that's why it goes through the mail room in that building uh, we were talking about Wells Fargo before I tried to look up the CFO there and I found it's a Timothy Sloan but nowhere on the website can I find any four Four digit, only the five digit zip code. Not Pick the four up digit the button. damn phone and ask him. Yeah, I'm going to. Okay. It should be on the bill when it comes from them. That's it. Yeah. Is, is there, I mean, um, do I have to do the uh, receipts and all these other things in, in order to go to the, um, in order to get to my um, Social Security and um, Certificate of Lab Birth account? Do I have to do those first, or can I just do my Certificate of Lab Birth and Social Security card? Well, I would try and cancel as many debts that you have, okay? Mm-hmm out here so that they know that you know what the system is about and basically that you have walked the path in the understanding and put it into play okay you try and go right to the one thing and basically then you're not going to know how to prevent from getting back into the system So you've got to understand some about the system in order to stay away from it or else they will trick you right back into the system and in a lot of cases they'll trick you back in in a worse scenario than you were before. You understand that? Yeah, it sounds yeah. like a course all on itself. Yes, because, yeah, I understand it. Because once you let okay. them know you know what you're doing, it, it'll, be that, it, it'll be that much easier to, to, to handle once you get to the big stuff. Yeah. And then basically all your certificates, like your driver's license, uh, your uh, certificate of title, state certificate of title to the vehicle, uh, they're all uh, surety instruments. And uh, your certificate of live birth, your Social Security account, uh, they're a security uh, instrument. And you would do a 1099-B against them. And at that point in time, you need to put down your living address that you're coming in and ordering the termination of those certificates. 
I submitted them in, but I submitted them in with the wrong uh, address. I needed to have that without my city and state on there, and then I had to have my name uh, proper with the semicolon between my given name and my clan name. And see, the machines look for small things like that because the machines can be programmed. Now, only certain people out here uh, are privy to this, and in some cases, the chief judge for the district, he can see some of those things that most of the other judges in the district won't understand some of those uh, small items. But the machines have been programmed so that when it scans it in or is inputted in, then it will flag it. But all the judges know that basically if you have care of and you have your name broken down with the semicolon and you have without in front of your city and state, they do not have jurisdiction over you. So the APEO goes after the semicolon? After the colon. After the colon. Okay, that's a new subject. Okay. A semicolon means basically a intermediate stop, but it's a continuation of the same subject. Okay? And your last name is still going to be part of you as uh, your name but it's not going to be applied until you die. But you came from that family that is buried in the cemetery because you have traits that you look like your grandfather. So it's a trait lineage of when you have a last name, okay, to show the lineage of the traits of the individual. And then you put the colon after your name, and that is a stop, new subject, and basically then you have a, you're put your title. Look up the definitions of, and I, I'm telling you this, look up the definitions so you understand what semicolon and colon mean. Look up the definitions of the, what the word the means, the definition of out, the definition of without, the definition of so, S-O. Some of these things you think are simple little words, and you think you know the, the full meaning of them, but I'll guarantee you there is more to understanding those simple words out here, that, and those are some of the words that get you into trouble. Because you don't know, you haven't read the operating instruction manual. Read over, but uh, uh, when you, the vast majority of the 1099 C's and even the A's are going to be in your uh, bankrupt or your estate EIN person's name, not in the living name. And then if you've got an EIN number, the IRS should have sent you a letter back and in that letter, it was telling you what address and everything to utilize to make sure that when they get that into the system, 
that you haven't put some other garbage in there that's going to confuse the machine. You confuse the machine, it's going to kick it out, and it's not going to record it, and basically it probably won't go anywhere. You're not getting talked to because the machine ain't going to talk to you. You're not dealing with the living individuals in that system any longer. You're dealing with machines. Just like the movie Matrix. And also the word soul. S-O-L-E is the individual, is you. S-O-U-L is the corporation. We were using the two words in the wrong connotation before. And you see, in some cases, the law dictionaries have it asked backwards. They get you to think that you are, you have a S-O-U-L, but no, that is for a corporation. And you have a uh, graven image corporation soul. That you are the individual, the S-O-L-E, out here. And then as the sole individual, you have a spirit. And as what they've done is they've essentially tried to take your spirit of understanding away from you. That's the 13th rib that they took away from Adam, was his spirit of understanding. Cain was able to get that understanding back because he can. Cain can. See now where the word can comes in. Cain had the understanding. He got rid of his social security person in the form of Abel. This system is nothing new out here. And you have to have an account number. Now I took uh, the old ID, that I, last one I think I did was back in April, and I turn around and modified that, put it down as Mr. Uh, period, Patrick, semicolon, divine. And then as an American, a, or American PEO, exempt. And we have to have an identification number. So when you become an exempt, what identification number do you have that basically flags you as an exempt? It's your 98 number. Because it says foreign grantor on it. So that is your foreign identification, your exemption identification number. So that would be what you could put on your identification. And then your street address and everything else is a care of and without. So now you have that right on your documentation. And basically, you've got your identification card now under seal as a principal executive officer of America with your principal executive officer's number. 
It's like a mini affidavit when you have signed and sealed that. Now, Pastor, you talking about just like you did those American ambassadors uh, a year ago? Yes, we were close to it. Okay, and all this stuff. Okay. But, see, I didn't see that basically the, the punctuation in the name was very key in uh, the process. The address, that without in there. And then basically the understanding of the depository number, the federal zone number. Now we have it all pulled together. Or at least I do, and I'm hoping I'm trying to pull you guys together. How do you figure out that uh, how the period, uh, how the machine reads the period, the semicolon and colon? Logic. Just, okay. Yeah, I went and talked to Mr. Spock. Okay. And the Anderson, you talked to Mr. Anderson too. Well, Mr. Spock in Star Wars. Or, right. Uh, Star right. Star Trek. And Mr. Mr. Anderson. It's illogical. Okay. Right. Think. Think about something, and basically, it was illogical to think that basically everything out here is being controlled by the human people, by the government employees. Most of those people are total nitwits. They're just space fillers, okay? They just take things and put them into the machines. It's the machines that are the ones that are really, that can be programmed to see certain items, especially on these uh, scannable documents that we're doing with the 1099 ABCs, submitting them in. Hey, Thomas, I got an answer for you. This is Steve in California. When you do computer language like Fortran a long time ago, we had to learn it. You say, if a colon, then do this. And if, if it's a semicolon, then do that. I mean, it gives the computer instructions when it sees it. Okay. It scans yeah. an array, and it knows what to do with the sentence you tell it to do. If this, then do this, you know. Yeah. Uh, if this I is greater so. than uh, or less than. You know, yeah, I understand. I'm a, I'm a programmer, but you know, still, it, it's hard to tell on the outside that that's exactly what the computer is doing. So, it's but like it is, you know, I guess a, I guess Pat Patrick has figured it out, and it makes a whole lot of sense. Well, it takes you all the way back to the old Commodores, to where uh, when those things first came out, uh, you had to write your own programs, and uh, the simple program that basically everybody that got the, the Commodore was to write a music program. Hmm. That was the simple program that basically everybody was sort of taught when you first uh, were writing your programs for the uh, Commodore machine. And right. Yeah, you had to put certain uh, language in to get it to operate. tell it to do if this, then you do this. If not, then you do this. Sort of like Stephen was saying there. Okay, any more questions on the 1099 uh, C's and A's, okay? You just need to sit down, fill them out, okay? Look at them, and then 
see what you're trying to accomplish. Who is, is it going to? And in all cases, uh, or when you're dealing with a corporation, it's going to be your person is the creditor or the lender. They're always the debtor or the borrower. And then if it's the living, and if we want to do a, a withdrawal from our account, then we would be uh, the creditor over our debtor account, our bankrupt, to do a withdrawal. But we have to cancel the debt, then that frees up that amount of credit. And then we're claiming that credit under the right of survivorship because that credit has been set adrift on the sea of commerce. You have salvage rights to it also. Patrick, can I just do a little review on the 1099-C? Um, the, the creditor's number is our zip code plus the four. The debtor's ID number would be theirs plus the four? In, in most cases, yes. Okay. And then we'll put their name, like to say Wells Fargo, and we'll repeat that down you would in put that it, address. You would put it CF, uh, uh, Wells Fargo, care of CFO, chief financial officer. You don't want it to go to the president. You want it to go to the chief financial officer who's going to handle the accounts. And then we'll put down the, 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 the city, the town, the state, and then the 4-zip again, that's their identification number, the same for the zip code, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then we can put just the last four digits of the account number because they're going to uh, know what that is. You put down X's for the, the number of the account and then just put in the last four digits. Right, to protect like, the If you're doing your, social, your, your certificate of live birth, it would be, uh, and see, several people have, different numbers on that certificate of live birth. For the vast majority of the people, it was supposed to be an 11-digit number. Three digits, so that would be three X's, dash two digits, which would be another two X's, and then six digits, so you would have X, X, and then one, two, three, four, whatever your last four digits are. That was supposed to be the numbering sequence ever since 1948 uh, out here, except for Pennsylvania. And they were supposed to stay on a seven-digit numbering system. Now, on a death certificate, basically it's a 13-digit account number because uh, the after the first three digits, it went to four digits for the full year in there. But now some of these states uh, out here, I think some of the birth certificates have that uh, four digit in them already. Ohio does. So it all depends on what they've registered you. And that's why you need to find out what your registration number is off your certificate of live birth. That's your account number there at the Treasury out here that is holding your bankrupt's account number. Now, one of the other things, like if you have a state instrument, like the certificate of title to your vehicle, certificate of title to your boat, your uh, mortgage, uh, certificate, uh, 
that is basically authorized by the state or your property tax uh, uh, I guess your certificate of title to your property okay you will normally find that they have a registration number of nine digits the driver's license may have a nine digit number that it's got a, a couple alpha letters in it. Those are still digits. And that is a state number. Okay? And that's a state. And then, see, that would be the debtor's identification number. And the debtor is basically the state of Iowa or whatever. They're the debtor by way of possibly the clerk of the court or whoever. But the debtor's account number, identification number, is going to be that driver's license because that's where the state assets are being held. Okay, so and if we were do, doing the driver's license, would that also then be repeated down there as the account number then? No. That would no. be the citation number, the receipt number. Okay. So you would have to do a 1099-C against each receipt or each traffic ticket citation number. Citation is another term or the, for a receipt. Okay. Or you're saying the title number on the vehicle if we're going after the title. That would be, that's the receipt number with that, that manufacturer. With the so that's account the account number, number down below. Yeah, yeah. okay. I'm, I'm following you there now. Yeah. Okay. See, it's, yeah, you go and get a window sticker off the Internet, or you go down and get a copy of the window sticker down at the local uh, dealership. Okay. So the receipt number is the VIN number that's on that window sticker. That's what you're wanting to go in, and you're canceling the debt for that receipt. That would be to the manufacturer. To the chief financial officer of the manufacturer. But if we're going to the state, then we're going to have to have that number off of the title is what you're saying. No. That's gonna, when you go uh, to the state, okay. You're, you're still going to use the VIN number? You would basically, yeah. Well, the, the, you've got a certificate, okay, a, a surety certificate, okay. Now that has a nine-digit number on it. At least here in the state of Iowa, uh, yeah, yeah, I, the I know title what you're number. Saying. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's what I was referring to. That number yeah, is that, different than at the state number. level. Yeah, that yeah, would be the, the state debtors. level. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That, yeah, I'm following you because that piece of paper has got a different. Not, it's got the VIN number on it, but it's got a different number that they've got it recorded or really uh, posted or whatever you want to say in their accounts. Yeah. See, it's a Mm -hmm. uh, you st you've got sort of like a different treasury that you're dealing with. You're dealing with the state treasury now that is holding mm -hmm. your assets. But there we would be using a 1099B, if I'm understanding you correctly. When you Let want them. to, when you want to terminate that certificate, yes. Yeah. Do we have to do the cancellation with the? A manufacturer first before we do the one with the state on the title? No. You can cancel the one, but basically you go in with the manufacturer, say your vehicle's eight years old, uh, you still put a 1099C in with the manufacturer. Uh, you should have the original value of that vehicle on that certificate of title. Uh, of what was recorded, okay, uh, yep. for that vehicle. 
And see, that's what you would put down as the cancellation of the debt back at the manufacturer would be that value on there. And then is what you're doing with the manufacturer is you're canceling the debt. You're straightening up their books for them, okay, and mm -hmm. bringing that into full receipt, receipt in full now, even though the debt has been paid, okay, the receipt hasn't been ledgered into full closure yet. Okay. And so then uh, you would put down there, debtor is liable for payment on the 1099C. You would put the fair market value still down as 20000 or whatever the vehicle cost, but on the 1099V, the property value that you are getting is the title. You want the manufacturer's ownership of transfer of total ownership, absolute ownership to you. Okay. You're not going to get any dollar value out of it. Okay. But are we going to get a dollar value from the state when we turn in that certificate for that? Yes. Yes. That's where the dollar value is going to come. That's what yes. the B, the barter, the, the brokering. Yeah. The broker fee, when they barter that out, they have to take out the taxes and everything in the bartering of that uh, certificate to bring it into full closure. That is the one to where in the temple back in Moses' time, you took your offering in, okay, you're offering that certificate up to them. They will take and cut away all the fat, the unjust usury, and give you back the lawful substance that was attached to that uh, calf or whatever the hell they were butchering up. Mm -hmm. The bowl, paper bowl, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, bowl is a uh, contract. Okay. Can we go back to the Wells Fargo part of it and just go down the right side now? Um, the date, it would be when basically we're sending that in now, right? To or when our they, mortgage. Yeah, when they issued that bill to you. Okay, that's the date it was identified. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's went into foreclosure, do I have to call them and get an itemization of that? I would. Okay. Find so out what would. the final closure of that is. Or basically mm -hmm. just go in and cancel the whole damn debt of the original contract. Just go after the original contract. Yeah, just cancel the whole debt from that original contract. Okay. I've got I've gotten a payout order from them for my But then you would have to come down and you would have to put down uh, out of the original contract you would put down the difference of what they owe back to you for the principal and interest that you paid in. So that would go into line seven. Okay. Back up a little bit. I, I lost something there. The full amount goes in B, or uh, two, correct? Yeah. Of the mortgage? And if we don't have the interest, do we have to fill out three? No. If you don't know what the interest is, you just leave it blank. Leave it blank. And then it's the mortgage. You never put you never put information in if you don't have the information, right? Right. Right. Okay. Right. Right. That, that's why and I you would try just... and get you try and get a closure out, and then you try and get them to uh, give you how much. You ask him, how much principal and interest have I paid in? Mm -hmm. I'd like to have a breakdown of the interest, principal and interest I paid in. Mm -hmm. 
Now they did sheriff auctions on me, so they will probably have another breakdown of that item to them. Oh, see, that's a third party uh, deck yep. collector. Okay. Right, but, but, but you going to go back after the main one, and then basically you would come back after the others as a fraudulent claim that they were operating in fraud. Yeah, I understand they're operating in fraud, but if I ask them for an itemization of it, then I'll have that information. Yeah. So now are you we have the total yeah, amount. Are they we have the, the house away from you? No. May I say something, Go ahead. Pat, may I say yeah. something? My yeah. house went up for auction the uh, same way just uh, a month ago. And um, I got smart. I talked to some realtors and made sure that they knew that it was under litigation because I had <clears throat> de demanded a subpoena from the president of that bank to produce the original documents, which he got the judge to twist uh, things up for him, and she agreed that I did not have, he did not have to accept those subpoenas. Long story short, it went to auction, and my realtor friend knew uh, other realtors, and I don't know if this is how it happened or not, but she let the word out that, that they were to talk down there the morning of the auction and say, this thing does not have a clear title. It is under litigation. Not one person, not even the bank, bid on that. Now, my last so-called bill from this bank I, they're still sending me monthly statements. It includes every bit of the attorney's fee, all drive-by inspections, appraisal fees, um, newspaper fees for um, broadcasting the information, you know, that it's going up for auction and blah, blah, blah. They have tacked on so far over the last three years um, close to $20,000. So I'm canceling the whole thing. I'm, I'm not going to mess with any details. I'm just going to cancel the whole thing. Yes. You're right up, but uh, you should cancel uh, the original mortgage contract. Okay. Yeah, I have. I, ha I, mm -hmm. I have. I've, I've done the um, endorsement on the back of that, and I'm sending it along with the C and just wiping it off. Yeah. But I would try and break the other down and then cancel that debt and basically uh, let the CID of the IRS know that this was racketeering fraud, okay? Yeah. Go out of yeah. 3949A against all the other racketeering charges. Yeah. I mean, I'd be, I'd think be, about I'd this. Be, all I'd these mortgages, be. all these mortgages on houses out here, Okay. They basically borrowed the money to I know. pay I for to that put house. Together. I used to put those things together. I know. And I, at the yes, time, I did not know what I was getting people into. Yeah. I and basically, putting, they're putting uh, the, the, Go ahead. the whole thing on a mortgage contract, okay? You take that mortgage and you run it out for the full 30 years that they have, Okay. You have paid out of your back pocket and also uh, from the usury of your account. You paid three times the value of that house at least. That's what I told them at the sheriff's office when they first came after me and the little girl in there tried to argue with me. I said, look, honey, don't argue with me. I know what I'm talking about. I used to do this stuff. And she just looked at me. She said, well, you need to come into arbitration. I, I just let her talk. So anyhow, see, that's where I am with mine, um, what I'm doing. But first things first, Patrick, I can go back later. But right now, I just need to get the thing out of my hair, get a clear title. Because I have buyers for my house, and I can't move it without a title. But is it going to give you clear title? Is that going to give her clear title, Patrick? without clearing up the, the other stuff, the third debt, third party yeah, I, fraud? Well, yeah, I, it should. Yeah, she's going in and she's trying to put in a cancellation for everything. Right. 
okay? So, uh, but to get the clear title, then you also need to, uh, I would go after the state with that uh, certificate of uh, title with the state. Okay. And get it in a royal title. Or absolute title, okay? Yeah. yeah. The true title. Which the state is holding in bondage right now. Yeah. Yes. And see, that would be, you need to have that brokered, and that would go to the land management of the state. Okay. Is there a, there would be a CFO of that then, the land land. It's called the land commissioner. Yes. Land commissioner. Okay. Norge, was that you who asked about the mortgage? Yep. Okay. I've been having fun with this one. Um, this is this has been a real learning session. Good. It seems like we're all working on the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the day of the auction, I, I think you can thwart them if you can get a realtor to get friends to go down there and speak speak that there, it does not have a clear title. It won't. Nobody will get a clear title. Even the bank didn't even bid on it. And I'm thinking to myself later, if a bank supposedly owns this thing, why are they bidding and taking it back? The whole thing is crazy. Because, well, that was cool. because they can make more money back on it again. They haven't risked anything. They have nothing to lose. Right. They're telling people, though, that they don't own it to start with. That's right. That's like uh, one of the guys down in South Carolina. Now, one of the other key things out here, when you're operating in their system, you have to put your claim in of ownership of that instrument or of that property if you're operating in their system. And you do that with the 10, with the, with the, you do that with the UCC-1. Yeah. And you have that registered with the Secretary of the State. Now, are you talking about this latest one? Whatever one you want, okay? okay you list the done. property that that's that done. belongs that's to you. That's been done months ago. Yeah. Okay. And you basically have, you present that to them, that you have this UCC-1 out here that you have to be paid. You're the preferred uh, creditor for that UCC-1, and you have a claim of, say, $250,000 against that $100,000 house. Now, you have to be paid first. That means, basically, if they sell it for $70,000, guess what the bank gets? They get shit. Nothing. You get the seventy thousand. I, I don't think they can go back again once that auction goes through like that, and nobody bid, and uh, everybody was just uh, dumb. Well, that's the thing. Nobody is going to bid. There's nobody is going to bid if there is a claim against that property. They might have Especially, found that already. Huh? They might have found that already because they didn't bid. These banks always bid. Yeah, and see, but uh, uh, the, one of the guys down in South Carolina, he did that, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then when the auction came up, the bank was the one that bought it, and then the bank turned around and tried to come and offer them a buyout. Hey, uh, you dropped your uh, UCC-1 against the house. Here, we'll give you... Uh, $18,000. Mm. And, you know, I'm also working on back taxes. Um, I've, I've, I submitted it, but I have to go in and do that change on the name. Yeah, you put the correction in, and basically you right. put that in. And it, now anything that is done at the state level, if you have, if uh, when you submit it in to the county treasurer, or to the clerk of the court or something like that, and they don't bring about the settlement, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You go to the state attorney general and file your complaint there. Okay. Because I think last weekend or tomorrow is tax lien sale. They bundle them up and sell them to corporations. Uh, after they're so old, they consider them a lien on the property, and when it's not paid, then they will bundle them up and sell them to corporations. So I will probably have to deal with a third party, too. Yeah, and a lot of those corporations are attorneys that are out there picking them up for 10 cents on the dollar or pennies on the dollar and yeah. uh, tr trying to turn around and make a 1,000% profit. Oh, yeah. So anyhow, just, just another scenario of, of what some of us are dealing with out here. But I'm, I'm, in, I'm on top of it. <laughs> Learning and mailing, filling out forms. Yeah, I'm basically, I mean, uh, you get more and more powerful every day when you uh, uh, sit here and start understanding what we're doing here. Yeah. This group is getting to be the most powerful group out here on the internet of understanding all of this stuff because we're going about it the right way. I know. I know. But boy, when you're juggling three things at one time, it's, and look at you. How many are you juggling? Yeah. No, it, 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 puts, it puts you to a test. Um, I know. I got 20, 22 or 21. Uh, mm -hmm. 1099 C's just on my damn traffic ticket, but uh, they'll get there. That's on one county. I've still got the other county that I've got to play around with. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, oh, we should complain, people. <laughs> he needs a secretary. <laughs> he needs he a needs driver. A he needs a cook. He needs a driver. He needs a secretary. Oh, I, I just oh, need God. some ink for my printer right now. Uh, oh, no. So that I can get that damn uh, stuff instead of running over to my mom's all the time, back and forth, trying to okay, eat the uh, people, 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 belly up to the bar. Each of us can send him a couple bucks. Is, is it an <laughs> HP printer, Patrick? Well, if you've got old cartridges, basically you can't use, that are HP cartridges, send them to me, Tom. I've got a whole bunch of HP ink that you can refill cartridges with. I'll yeah. send that to you. What yeah, what I'm kind of this, HP do you have? It, it'll, right it'll, it, it'll, uh, ink is for the 21, 22, 27, and 28 cartridges. Well, basically, I, I know how to suck the ink out and put it into these to the other cartridges that I have. I think I'm using 56s. Okay. I, I think I have enough ink for the rest of your life, Patrick. I'll get it right out. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you were supposed to have done that. Why did I you know. <laughs> I, I slipped up. You did. Well, I know. I know what it's like. Some days my kitchen doesn't get cleaned for almost a week. <laughs> I mean, really cleaned. I'll box it tomorrow. Well, it's in a box already. I'll tape it up tomorrow. Yeah, at, at, at the price of those cartridges, there's ways to trick those cartridges uh, around in the machine, okay? You don't put the same one that you just took out back in, okay? You use one that you previously pulled out before, and then uh, there's a way to override that. Huh. And half these damn printers are basically, uh, they're only good for like maybe two years at a whack anyway. So, uh, and, but once we get through this scenario, basically we'll be buying several of them up there and basically we could throw them away. Yeah. Yeah. So on the right side on the on the ten ninety nine C Patrick, we don't do anything with line six. Is that something for the IRS that they do a dental vent code no. there or something? No. Oh, hey. You need to fill in line six. Look in the instructions. That is either going, and in most cases, it's going to be uh, either A or B. But there's, uh, I think, seven different alpha codes that you can put in there. The prime one is A, which is bankruptcy. 
and see what they do. In 1933, they placed us in bankruptcy. The next one is B, and I think that is uh, under a judicial action. So those are normally the two that you would be operating with is either a judicial or a bankruptcy action. So for Wells Fargo, it would be a bankruptcy one there. Yeah. For a mortgage. Okay. Yeah. You're dealing with a bank, right? Yep. Right. And basically, it's a rupsy. <laughs> it's a rupture. Yeah, and we're rupturing them. Patrick, I don't mind you. Huh? Brain ever overheat? Do I ever overheat? No, your brains. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's always running. <laughs> no, I still got all my quite a bit of my hair up there, so I haven't burned it off yet. Ask Good. him when he sleeps. <laughs> I got a question. Yeah. Okay, we have a judgment, a local state judgment. We would send that to the attorney general or to the clerk of the court. It was basically like what I put down there. Uh, you're dealing in the clerk of the court's office, so basically that's the cash red cashier, and basically she is working for uh, the judicial district of the state, okay? And also uh, it's uh, tied into uh, the correctional center, the probation correctional, or the, yeah, the probation correctional department. Okay, now if I have a judgment on somebody else, who would, does that, does that go straight to the Attorney General? From a contract. If you have a claim against somebody else, you just file a 1099-C against them. And cancel it. Okay. Or and I'm going to acquire the funds. against them. Okay, put well. the claim in. Let the IRS basically uh, go after them. Say I'm going to place a tax uh, claim against you. <laughs> and it's, so the local mom and pop say like an orthodontist for braces for a kid. Would, where would we? What, what's the complaint? Right. Okay, what's the complaint? Are you out here to harm your neighbor or what? No. Okay. Can you forgive and forget? Right. Cancel the debt. Yeah. Cancel the debt and basically then they they would owe something back to uh they've made a benefit of that now. And they're going to have to claim that on their taxes. And to, to pay a bill such as like an orthodontist, we would do a voucher with the A, B, and C? Okay, this is an orthodontist with a dentist? Yep, for, for, the, for my son, trying to pay his, uh, his $5,000 orthodontist bill. Okay, this... This is a claim of harm or what? No, just I would I want to get access the money out of my account to pay to pay the bill to the person providing the service. Okay. Now, did uh, they go in and basically uh, see all medical? Okay. This whole medical racket is uh, tied into this system. You do a 1099C against them. Uh, for the debt because they borrowed the money. They've already taken the vacation on the payment uh, down to Cancun off of that. Hmm. I got it. Okay. Yeah, you cancel My the point. debt against them because they basically went in and did a bank, 
acceptance or a trade acceptance to borrow the money from you. Now, they're trying to get you to pay out of your back pocket out here. But that medical uh, department is, they have a license, don't they? Of course. Yes. So they're under license in the state, okay, to okay. give you that, service. That, that clears it up. That, that clears it up. <laughs> Okay. I was kind of classifying it as the mom and pop down the street, you know, but you're right with the licensing that, that I didn't even see that there. Yeah, because see, I'm that not... license is a, uh, is a surety contract that they have also with the state. You can put a claim, and if they've harmed you, then you can put a claim in against the license, not against the individual, against the machine. Right. Okay. Which is the license. Okay. See, that's what a lot of these people have been trying to do. They've been going after the wrong. They've been going after the individuals. The individuals are just nitwits out here, just running amok, sort of like in the movie Matrix. Okay. When they go into the Matrix, you see all these people, but they see. That is not who you need to really go after. You need to go after the machine. That's what Neil had to do at the end. He had to go after Mr. Smith, who was part of the machinery in the system. Then you had the, uh, several of the other actors that were different components in the machine, like the Frenchman and the... Uh, uh, I forget what the hell that other damn the conductor or uh, the train the train man I guess it was in the system there. Is there more than one matrix that you're looking at, Patrick, on the movies? No, there's only th the three, the three trilogies. Okay. The three, I, I, the three I movies those. that made up the trilogy. Yeah. But there was a lot of stuff in there. I mean, basically, uh, in most cases, most people didn't see all the little details. Well, I guess I got just the Matrix, but there's there's two more that I got to watch. Yeah, there's yeah. the Matrix Reloaded. And then the okay. final one is the Matrix Revolution. Okay. Yeah. Because I I didn't pick up the ones that you were talking about, you know, but they must be in other movies. Yeah. The other two movies. That yeah. The other two Matrix up. movies. Okay. And then basically there's a whole bunch of other ones out here that have been telling us bits and pieces. I just watched another one. Uh. Uh that is about the order, about, uh, and in the order, it talks about this uh, priest that becomes a soul eater. Hmm. And see, that's what, uh, in the movie, uh, the ghost writer was that basically uh, Nicolas Cage ended up absorbing the souls. Mm -hmm. the corporate souls. He was the one that basically had the knowledge that could stand in both the living world and the dead world and control the corporate souls, the graven images that people had created. And used them against the corporations at that point in time. I have one more question, and I don't, um, you know, I, I'm going to use the way the Wells Fargo has put my name, but you've never mentioned anything about the middle name or the middle initial. Well, but basically, the the usage would normally be a hyphen between your first given, and see, 
you're only supposed to have one Christian name per se, so you would put a hyphen between that and the next name in line. Mm -hmm. And then the semicolon would go after that middle name that you would have. So it's like two given names, but you're just hyphenizing them between, is what you're saying? Well, you would have uh, uh, like uh, Tom Jones uh, Smith, okay? So you would have Tom hyphen semicolon and then Smith. Mm -hmm. Or let me see how that. Tom hyphen Jones semicolon Smith. No. For the client, for the client. Lines, okay. Yeah, you're supposed to put a hyphen between two nouns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And see, you join the two names together uh, in a semi-process, okay? Some along that lines. Steve could probably explain it a little better. <laughs> so if they just m use the middle initial, you'd still just put a hyphen in there? No. No, you want to. You don't want to use a middle initial, really. You want to use the whole name then. Yeah, and you if hyphenate it. If yeah. you're going to use it. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, leave it out. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, you'd be putting a period in, and you would bring some. You'd be bringing it to a stop. Yeah. In the uh, middle of the, was, in the middle of the sentence. That's why I was questioning that. Yeah. Now, if you were given just the letter A as your middle name, okay, that is not a uh, a dot, okay, because it doesn't have any, uh, the letter A is your name, okay, your middle name, okay, but if okay. it's Alfred, you need to put the whole Alfred in there. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys, you know what Social Security has done to me on that? When I first signed up as a young lady, I had my full name, okay? First, middle, and last. Somewhere along the way, and I, I have neglected to notice where, but they changed it and only used my middle initial, but there is never a period. Never. Yeah, then that they own me. that name. Or they yeah. think they own it. Right. They're like doing a survey of it, and then they're claiming that's part of their property or something. Yeah. Well, basically, they can't have that period in there, or else basically they bring that name to a stop intermediately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, well, yeah so, when you said that, I yeah. thought, oh, now that makes sense why they've done that. Yeah, because the computer would uh, reject that. Mm-hmm. Well, I found it interesting. I had went to the county trying to get my certificate of live birth, which they refused to work with me on it, but that's, I got to go to the vital statistic, I know that. But yeah. uh, I was checking on some vehicle titles, and when they had given me a driver's license years back, they hyphenated my middle name, so they got some vehicles registered under that, and now they've put the whole name on, my whole middle name, and they got some vehicles registered under that name also. So I've got like two accounts with them. Okay, <laughs> now, said. you were going to the county. Is that your Berting County? I tried to, yeah, and they wouldn't work with me either. It was your they Berting said, County. Yes. Not some other county in the state, but the county that you were born in. Correct. I tried okay. the, the local county where I'm living right now. And they wouldn't work. And they said I had to go to the birthing county. I went to the birthing county. They said they had just had a meeting two weeks prior, and they couldn't give that information out anymore. Okay. Did you have valid identification? Yeah, I knew the gal there because I'd been there with my mother. No, I mean, did you? Did they ask you for valid identification? No, they did not. Okay. They and tried they still to give me give a. It to you? Okay, uh, then you go to the county attorney and file a complaint with the county attorney. 
Okay. Because they're failing to do their job. That's like a. You yeah. Know, Basically, that is freedom no of information. Okay. <laughs> that doctor, you have every right to look at that ledger book of your recorded birthing. Mm hmm. I was taken in the back room uh, at my birthing county. They covered up the other parts that did not apply to me, but I saw the entry in the book. I asked them, can I see the entry in the book? Okay. And it's nonfeasance and malfeasance and misfeasance of their job. Oh. But, see, that county attorney, he works for the attorney general of the state. Mm hmm If the county attorney don't comply, you file a complaint with the attorney general against that county attorney, too. Mm hmm okay. The attorney general is the head poncho for justice in the state. They have to give you like I said before, the four crowns out here are the government is the lowest crown on the totem pole. You as the living are the top crown on the totem pole while you're alive. Mm -hmm. Then when you die, then you drop down and you get put back into the state, the principal source that you came from, okay, mm -hmm. but that uh, county attorney, basically, he is the one, and see, uh, when you start getting your name down right and your jurisdiction uh, right with your address, now they have, they, they can't rebut it. You are an American principal executive officer. You're giving them an executive order. Well, I, I went one step different. Uh, you know, rather than trying to fight with them, I went to the hospital, and they did pull up my mother's maternity registration and it showed some of the information on me but they haven't uh, they're going back through microfish to pull up the record at the hospital for me so I have been like your birth on. weight and height and stuff like that yep that was yep. on that record but and it yep. said that I was registered but it doesn't give me the registration number and stuff no it's not going to give you the registration number but see in that county record book that registration number should have come back down from the state and be recorded at the county level, too. Mm -hmm. At least here in the state of Iowa, they have it in the book, and when they print out a county uh, certificate of live birth under the state title, it carries the same weight, but it doesn't have uh, the picture of the certificate of live birth that was actually filled out on it. But both of them, at the state level and at the county level here, they have the registration number on there. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these other nitwit states that have kept that from the people because they keep people were getting too many of them, and uh, that certificate of live birth registration number is your account number at the Treasury. Right. And that's why you don't want to have out. So when you uh, go and get a uh, and see a lot of this stuff didn't come about until roughly about 1974. Prior to that point in time uh, uh, the certificates of uh, by birth were controlled by the clerks of the court because you had to have it registered in by the court 
by the Justice Department. And the clerks of the court are working as part of the Justice Department. Because I think on my mom's paternity thing, it says that it was an RN that, that registered it, registered the live birth. Well, basically sent it over, but it was the state registrar that basically got it registered. Okay. Right. Right. But the RN did it at the hospital. Yeah. Recorded it uh, there. Yep. Okay. Yep. And sent it to wherever. Yeah. See, that was the the official reporting was by that RN. Okay. And see, there's a difference between the official recording and a registration. Yeah. Yeah. So if I go back out to the county, get a hold of the county attorney, I could get the number right there then. Just try and go to the state and bypass yeah. the damn county networks, okay? Right, right. That's that's what I was going to do, but I thought, well, I'll see what the hospital comes up with. But. Well, yeah, you need to find out your birthing weight and stuff like that, okay? Well, that was on have, that. That was on that form. It was on the one at the state level? No, no, no. The one, the one that they give me from the hospital. It had my okay. birth weight. Well, you've already got time. that then. Okay. So now just I, go I, to the state and get the registration number for your certificate of live birth, so you know your account number at the treasury. You're, you're right, spending but, a lot of time on something that basically uh, you could simplify down. If you're running a problem at the lower level, always go to the higher level. Mm -hmm. Okay? Don't sit there and spin your wheels in the mud. No, I, I'm not. I just let the hospital do their thing, and I was going to go to the state, but I just haven't gotten to there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to try and get these others in so basically you can have the money to... Uh, Go and rent, have a chauffeur drive you up there to the state capitol. <laughs> right. Okay. That's what I need. That's okay. what I need. Then I don't have to worry about parking because they try to charge yeah. everybody for meters and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Your hospitals have like the HIPAA law. You're not going to get anything out of them. Well, you can uh, basically if you. Uh, uh, they they're supposed to have a. Uh, set of records, okay, of each birthing, okay, they won't have, they won't issue out, they don't have a copy of that hospital birth certificate necessarily with the feet on it. That was a one-time issue recording, yeah. okay, and that was only to be given out to the mother uh, when she took her child out of the hospital. Okay, so that basically that document matched up with the child that was being released. It's a receipt. Hmm. God, even said okay, on my that's mother's really form. what that was, but it was a recorded receipt. Now, they won't necessarily have that unless some of them had the capability of microfishing at that point in time. But uh, I don't think if uh, you were born back in the 1940s or something like that, they had the capability of microfishing at that point in time. Well, I was in the 50s, so they said that okay. they've got, got the records and they're going through and they are doing a table or an indexing table. For yeah, but the maybe. records that they're probably going to find is just your blood type, okay, your birth weight, your height, and several uh, vital statistics, your your blood type, your height, uh, your weight, uh, those type items. Right. They won't have your feet necessarily prints. 
because that went on to that paper form that would have been the certificate of live birth that should have been your release paper, like your claim check when you check out of the airport. You have to have your claim check attached mm -hmm. to your baggage, and then you have to have your ticket, and the two have to match up, or else you don't take that baggage out of the airport. Well, on the form, it asked who took this child from the hospital, and it said mother or parent. It did say that on the form. Are we still going after our birth weight in gold, Patrick? It should come about in the process when you do uh, your claim in uh, with the certificate of live birth. Okay. But you need to know what your birth weight is, and then down the road, if they don't give it to you when they cancel out the certificate of live birth, and you move your assets over to the post office side of the ledger book, at that point in time, you can put your claim in for that amount of gold. But there again, when you totally understand the system, why would you want to weigh yourself down with gold? Because you might have to swim across the lake, and basically uh, the more weight you put on, it's going to be harder to swim across that lake. Yep. Leave it in the depository account, and the, then you can access it any time you want to. It's stored about five miles underground underneath Springfield, Missouri. Hmm. So it's in a pretty safe location. In that account, is that taxable? Huh? Is there, in the post office account, that's not taxable, right? Non-taxable. Non-taxable. Because it, because it is uh, the fees that you're getting in to that, and the tariff taxes have already been taxed. See, all tariff taxes have to go back to the land, and you're the land above, so you receive the benefit of those taxes. Mm -hmm. So you're the tax collector. Look right. up in all the statutes and everything. It never clearly identifies who the tax collector is what department that tax collector is working for. That's because in basically most all situations, the real tax collector is we the people. We have to be the tax collector. They tell us what taxes we need to collect and then we need to come in and collect them by doing the 1099-C and canceling the debt and claiming the credits. The credits that we're claiming is the taxes that are due to us. See, this is an accounting nightmare. I mean, you've really got to think outside the book on a lot of this stuff. Most definitely. Hey, but, Patrick, but I didn't want to task you about the the birth weight in gold, but I, I know it's a tradition from long ago, but it's not. I couldn't find it anywhere in the Bible, and I couldn't find it like anywhere in the nation's traditions. You know about it, and we sort of know about it, but it's where do you think it came from? Was it just something that was given to newborns so that they could survive? Like a canteen okay. or something? <laughs> I think uh, you'll find it in King Midas. Yeah. I never heard of okay. that before. King Midas. So where, the king, where the king had to be given his birth weight in gold. Or his weight in gold. Mm -hmm. Is Midas a name or is that a, a function of being a king? No, I don't know. 
okay? It's a metaphor. Good. All of these things are metaphors. Yeah. Okay? The whole Bible yeah. is a holy book. It's full of holes. Okay? Yeah, it's, it's, it's written in parables for only for certain people to understand uh -huh. and lose the rest of them. Well, wasn't, wasn't Jesus given gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Mm -hmm. Yes. His family were rich. Yeah. And see, that was one of the key things. And then basically they took it, they gave it to him, and then basically they took it away because he was registered. And see, that's why he came back later on and was trying to reclaim it when he came of age and understanding because the temple priests were holding it. Hmm. The like bankers. a Sestake. Like well, a Sestake account, kind of. Huh? No, no, like in trust, but not a trust. Okay. Okay. They were holding it on deposit. Okay. In a deposit carry account that they were able to utilize that. They had to maintain it uh, there but they could write bonds and everything else out against it. And see, that's when they started putting, and see, this monetary system, like I said, goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. In fact, it goes even further back than that time around because it goes back to the first Genesis. See, we're in the second Genesis right now the second cycle, the second 50,000-year cycle. This planet ain't uh, billions of years old. Basically, it's only, uh, after it was formed, it's only had two gener genesis on the planet of where the human souls, S-O-L-E, have existed. Yeah, they found like gold mines in South Africa that were some were eighty thousand years old and some were almost two hundred thousand years old. That's what they're saying. But yeah. how do they find that timeline? They try and do it by carbon dating. Carbon dating is a fallacy of time because basically the Earth has been inundated at certain points in time mm -hmm. by radiation from the sun. Right. So their whole carbon dating system is totally screwed up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Horowitz down in Florida has disproved a lot of that stuff, like the age of the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon was formed uh, probably in less than one month's time frame. Wow. You go into uh, a modern uh, machinery shop nowadays, and the best cutting tools that they have is high-pressure water. It can cut right through steel. Well, if you have a high-pressure water coming down, even through solid bedrock, it will cut right through it when it's funneled in a certain path. It's sort of like a jet stream. Yeah, they found Egyptian artifacts in a cave in the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And it's locked up, and it's under control of the Smithsonian Institute, which is also controlled by uh, the Church of Rome. Yeah, Jesuits. Not the Jesuits, necessarily. The religious, the white pope. I told you the story of a scenario about the black and white. Right, right. 
okay. the black guys so have the don't substance. think that the black guys are all the bad guys. All right. Have you spoke with Christopher Summers lately? No, I haven't. He he said that um, you know he did uh, about 130 pages to Mortgage Fraud Task Force, and I guess the Jesuits want to look into what he's saying and have a meeting with him. He's saying you know he was all happy that they invited him to have a meeting. He's exposing all this mortgage fraud. He's going to have a meeting with them. Well, basically, I mean, you can expose it a lot simpler there uh, by just doing a 1099-C, and basically you stop them dead in their tracks. Yeah, I was trying to get them to think about that. Yeah. I mean, that's just like Rod Plass continually trying to fight traffic tickets down and uh, certain things down there in uh, uh, South Carolina or North Carolina, where he's at. Yeah. yeah. Uh, basically wanting to constantly fight them instead of learning and understanding the system. Yeah, he's beating his head against the wall. Yeah. You're 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 in you're you're within the matrix until you come out of the matrix, you can't fight the matrix. Neil had to come out of the system before he could fight the system or bring the system into harmony. Yeah. That's a fantastic movie. I just saw some clips or trailers on the second or third one. I don't know which one it was, but it's pretty entertaining. Well, it's entertaining, but it's also very informative. Yeah, you have to watch it a few times to figure it out. Yes, and that's why I said, people out here, you need to watch the movies. You need to listen to these audios more than once. You Most think you hear what I'm saying, but in a lot of cases, you're not really getting the full understanding of what I'm saying. I even yeah. have to go back and make sure that I have the proper understanding in some cases. Yeah, I know you have to hear something like four or five times and then take a big nap and forget everything you used to know and then listen to it another three or four times and then you really sort of know it. Yeah. So anyway, these, uh, when you put down and then... Uh, uh, like I said, uh, we've gotten some of these things back, and the IRS is out here been trying to help us in this whole damn process. But like you said, well, any of these the politicians understand. could have helped the whole country out if they just dropped a, a sentence or two. Yeah, but see, they're nitwits. Right. They don't know what the shit they're doing. They're run amok. Okay? They're, they have been, uh, just like in the movie uh, Matrix there, Mr. Smith has pushed his hand into them, and basically now they become lookalikes like Mr. Smith. They don't, they don't know that they're supposed to be an individual anymore. And that's what's happened to this whole country. The whole governmental system has been inundated that they think that they have to uh, protect the bankers, that the bankers are the ones that are uh, the savior of the country. The bankers are the destroyers of the country. But they don't see it because they are all cloned over as being Mr. Smiths now. Right, too big to fail and all that. They got all yeah. this, all this. Uh... Gives no meaning to Mr. Smith goes to Washington. <laughs> well, no, let's don't mix and match uh, <laughs> things that are not 
um, okay. out here. Okay. That was a totally different scenario. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> now, if you want to do a comparison with the Wizard of Oz, yeah, there's some similarities there. No, I meant the contradiction. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's part of the problem is people try and go and they try and correlate the wrong item into what somebody else is trying to show you as uh, the valid thing. Like the movie Majestic. The Majestic. They see it pointed out several items right in there. He wasn't going to take the Fifth Amendment. He took the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. That they see the government cannot create any religion. A, another belief that is in contradiction to what the Constitution laid out. And that's what they've done. They've created another religion or another belief in out here under their graven image system of all their dead laws. They polluted the living laws with, the, with these new dead laws. The original charter laws. Primarily to take our crown of authority away from us. So, yeah, I just saw that uh, last week. Yeah, so concentrate on uh, getting that W-8 form in. Uh, if you've got the capability, uh, try it. Uh, with that ID that I had up there before and go in and modify that appropriately uh, to address what I uh, now have uh, laid out here. Your proper name, your proper address, and uh, then your exempt ID number if you have your 98 number. That would be your uh, principal, executive, officer, ID number. Now, uh, will we be sending in our affidavit of principal, executive, officer uh, with our first 1099 C's and A's? Not with the 1099 C's, okay? You would give me W-8 form. Okay. Okay. That affidavit only goes into certain places, like with the Attorney General. Huh. So when we send something to, to the Attorney General for the first time, we should include the affidavit? Yes, I would. Okay, okay. And show them your, uh, uh, that you have an understanding you can. On the affidavit, do we have to put the without in the address? Yes. Anytime you're using your living address now, put without in front of the city. I mean, in the, because, the affidavit, the PEO affidavit, should we add that in there? Because you've got the care of in the yeah, address. I've got the care of, but I didn't have the without in it. You have to put that in. Right. That's why I'm saying we should add that to that one. Yes. Yeah, he just told yes, you that. That's what I'm saying. Anytime yep. you use your yep. Yep. principal executive officer or your living name, you need to have without in front of the city. Because if you do not have that in front of the city, then basically they're operating under the presumption that you're under the ecclesiastical laws of the bishop because you're going into the city carry, the, the city graveyard. 
you're under that jurisdiction of the city graveyard. But you're without, and you're coming in as a visitor to the cemetery, and you can leave at any time. They don't have jurisdiction over you. So are we changing the name and putting all the semicolons and, and that in yes, there? Yes, you need to that. do all of that. Le need to add don't that ask to me that. that. You need to know that, okay? Well, I'm, I'm understanding that, but I hadn't sent the letter out yet, the affidavit out, so I'm thinking that I should just change all that now rather than... Yes, Wait. change it now, okay? Yep. yep. Make the that's corrections, I mean. okay? That, that's what I'm saying. If you haven't figured out what we've been talking about all night, you need to listen to the tape again tomorrow because <laughs> he, he's been telling us this over and over again all night. Yes, I know. Yes. I, I'm hearing it. I'm just... Yeah, you have to make the corrections the way that they went over them right now, okay? Yep. Otherwise, yep. you're still operating in their system. Yep, following you. Okay. I'm just making it clear for the people that are not asking. Okay. And see, this is a quasi-debt. It's a fictional debt. Watch the movie International. The, the <laughs> bankers have risked not one red dime. In fact, most of them at the Federal Reserve never paid their initial payment that they were required to when they set up the Federal Reserve Bank mm -hmm. to become shareholders. And see, they're operating for a profit. We have to claim their profit back from them. Mm -hmm. You've given us a lot of details tonight, Patrick, on how to apply these these uh, 1099s in various uh, ways. So that's really good. Thank you. It's been very helpful. Okay. Well, hopefully, uh, yeah, just sit down and uh, take a couple copies of it, uh, tear, tear them apart. Uh, so now you've got the A, B, and C, but basically uh, fill them out in different scenarios until you get a good solid understanding you can always order some more of them okay I just went through 15 of them I've tried to lay out a template of filling them out but the 15 that I did using that template I had the wrong thing so I just had to throw 15 of them away luckily I ordered a double order when I sent it in for 30 sheets of 1099C, so I had a backup uh, supply. And see if you get the right program, and I use Nitro PDF out here, and uh, then I can go in and I can fill those blocks in, but it takes a little practice to set the printer up for those blocks, and then you move, remove the background away from them. So now all you're doing is printing out the boxes that you filled in. Yes, yeah, so Adobe Acrobat has the that feature too to print only the field data and not the form. Okay, but there again, you're you're. You'll have to practice a little. Oh, you yeah. Print the, you print the first sheet, then you tear it off, then you put the second sheet in. I don't think I would risk putting the third sheet in when you tear it apart because now you're getting pretty thin, and uh, the printer will probably jam up 
most printers because mm -hmm. you need to have those peripheral holes because that uh, then gives you the full eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper when it goes into the printer. Mm -hmm. So when you tear that side item off, now it becomes a smaller sheet. And then also when you uh, do the printer, make sure that uh, you do not have a shrink to printable area on that. Uh, uh, print, print actual size. Yeah, print actual size. Yes. Well, I just got my forms on Saturday, and I was looking at them, and I was wondering if I could use an old typewriter and feed them You may be it. able to if you've got it, one that can basically hammer through all three copies. But there again, uh, you're going to play around uh, trying to line up the, print, the typewriter in each one of those blocks, uh, adjusting it. Uh, sometimes a little because uh, when you type the first line in, uh, as it goes down through, it may or may not, uh, the spacing may throw you off and you may be typing over uh, outside the box on the next one as you go all the way down through the sheet. So uh, there again, it's going to be something you got to play with. Well, that's what I thought I would sounds like the easiest way is what you started out with, that we do the copy B and C's using the computer, but we then we write out the A's by hand. Yeah, and basically uh, the one, the, the easiest way, which is the hardest way, uh, you'll get finger cramp, is to use a black, black ballpoint ink pen and handwrite every one of them out. You shouldn't have that many, okay? So I would uh, primarily just get the ones that you need to get out uh, in this out there to get going, okay? Right. Yep. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. I've been waiting for these forms to get them going. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can now, get you, started with the. Now you got some. I'd put another order in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. You can start actually, to put... Yeah, if you don't use them all, you can hand them out to other people, okay? Start yep. getting the word out. Yep. Which IRS did you order them from? You only There's one only person. one that you can order them from, and that's basically the phone number, and basically it comes out of Bloomfield, Illinois. Okay. That's where it okay. came from. 1-800-TAX-FORM. Okay. Or you can go online and order them online. Well, they said it would take 10 days, and I think it was that or more. Now, 7 to 10 days is what they try and uh, guarantee that you'll get them in. But you, but you can do the, right now, uh, with the uh, forms you, fillable forms you have, do the B, B's and C's and get the transaction started and then send the A's in later. The A copy. The A copy, right. The yeah. A copy. That's what I'm going to do. But I wouldn't wait around too long, especially if you've got, uh, you want to get those in. Uh, so as soon as you get uh, several of them done, you get one sheet done. Uh, just fill out the 1096 and send it in. Yep. A bunch of us are trying to get things out this week. Now, otherwise, you'll uh, sit around, you'll procrastinate, and basically then uh, six months later, you'll go through your damn papers, and you'll find, oh, shit, I didn't send that thing in. Oh, uh, God, we have fires to put out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got these tax forms that have to go out. And like no, I, I want to stop, I want to stop all, your receipts, all your receipts, every receipt you get, Keep you start it. setting up a little uh, box 
and you drop those receipts into that box. And like I said, if you have a family of younger kids or something like that, that basically have them sit down and try and uh, have them put them into a ledger, okay, either in a book format or if uh, they're computer literate, which in most cases some of the kids are more computer literate than the adults are, have them put it into an Excel file, and then you check that on a weekly basis. You make that part of their allowance as a family member, a household servant member, until they come of age. That is what they're working for to get their weekly allowance. Then when you get the return, you can basically uh, give them 10% of the return of those receipts and put it into a savings account or a checking account for them. Use it as a learning tool. Yes, good idea. Now, the savings account doesn't necessarily have to be a interest-bearing savings account. It can be like a safety deposit account. One that they have restricted access to until they come of age. Hmm. Now, you only allow them so much access to it. Okay. Well, when it comes to college stuff, we should be able to do the 1099-C for that for college stuff then, too. Yes, you cancel the whole damn debt. They yep. borrowed. They took out a trade acceptance with the Federal Reserve Bank against your account. But see, it's a false debt out here. After three years, that loan, that student loan that basically you took out is fully paid for. But they have everybody under the presumption that they uh, now, after four years of college, they're now obligated to pay that thing back. So now they're taking money out of your back pocket and destroying your life for you. By putting this false debt over you when it's actually been fully paid for after three years. So you have to go in and cancel the debt. No, would they have taken it out of my account or my daughter? They account? would have written bonds against your account. My they didn't account. actually take the money out. They wrote bonds under a three-year wagering contract, just like the mortgage on the house. They can only deal with bondage. Mm-hmm. But it's See, that's what they're bond. doing. They're placing you under a false bondage system. You could have gone in and paid it outright out of your uh, account up front using the 1099 Your recording has reached the maximum length. To replay your message, press 1. To delete and re-record your message, press 3. For What's delivery options, about? press 4. To send a fax, press 6. To cancel this message... Who, who was that? Or did we give up on... I don't know. Whether yeah, you're, you know uh, what? I did a... Uh, out. Probably has. I left a message on somebody else's phone, and, and then I clicked back to this call, but I don't know. Okay, know that's, pro that's probably what it was then. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
sorry, you're wrong. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah, so basically everything is under bondage, and see, that's we placed these graven images out here, and uh, it's under a quasi debt, a fictional debt. The whole national debt in this country is a quasi debt. So would you have to wait until college was, the four years of college was over with? Could you just do a 1099 when the college bill came in um, for that semester? You could basically do a cancellation of the debt, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, basically against your fictional person mm -hmm. by sending it into the Secretary of the Treasury with a 1099-V, making him uh, the vouch E. You cancel the debt that your fictional person is holding in D.C. under a certificate of live birth, mm -hmm. and then you mark uh, the debtor, uh, you mark five, uh, four, five, and six on that 1099-C. Now they have to transfer that payment to you. And that's what I tried to do the other day by going to the Federal Finance Bank and putting a 1099-A against them. I canceled so much debt for $250,000 See, they're a bank. Now, then they have to turn around, and so you give them the withdrawal receipt, which is the 1099-C, and then they now have to transfer that funds over to you. So... We're waiting to see what's going to happen because uh, they haven't had their full three days, working days, out here. But tomorrow, I will probably be calling them up if I uh, am able to get everything else in the mail that I want to try and get in. I'm going to try that, work on that first to get the items that I have into the mail. Then I will be on the phone to the Attorney General's office and to uh, uh, that Federal Financing Bank or to the Treasury Inspector General to mm -hmm. find out what the hell the holdup is. Where's your money? Yeah. Okay, good. But see, you have to do that also. Okay? Well, Don't uh, we, wait for me no, to we, give you... Oh, yeah. we're doing it. We we sent okay. our documents and it's just that I need to make a correction with the without. I need to make an address change. Yeah, the, if that's the, what the holdup is, uh, and in some cases, uh, some of these places have fax machines that you can fax those items <coughs> right into them and say, here, this needs to be associated with that certified mail uh, presentment that I gave you. Uh, three days ago. Now release the ship. Hmm. Okay, any other major problems there? No, I you think you've answered quite a few. <laughs> yeah, you covered a whole lot. <laughs> Patrick, you're going to keep us very, very busy. Uh, if you listen I, to that tape yesterday and this one today, basically that should give you a pretty strong understanding. Yes. But you're not going to get the strong understanding until basically you sit down and play with the forms and uh, listen to the tape and put uh, pen to paper. Right. And uh, getting the understanding. And then also by breaking out the dictionary, uh, and I've tried to ex express the importance of getting an Oxford uh, Universal Dictionary because 
a lot of words you're not going to find in the law dictionaries. Even in Anderson, you're not going to find certain words mm -hmm. in there. And in some cases, you need to go back to uh, an old Oxford. At least they will give you, like on citizenship. Everybody is scared to death of citizenship. But you need to read what it says about citizenship out there. And it starts off with the understanding that in Rome, citizenship basically uh, was one who had complete uh, authority in Rome, okay, over, now they had secondary citizenship, which is like you becoming a United States citizen or a state citizen. That is a secondary citizenship that now has restricted you to certain items. That citizenship needs to be gotten rid of. That's the false citizenship of being uh, claimed as under very jurisdictional control. You're supposed to be out of control. Okay. So, and so you're saying that the Roman citizens are uh, pretty equivalent to what, what you're describing as the principal executive officer now. Or the American citizen. Yeah. And then the, the civil citizen that they talked about in there, that basically only had civil rights is the one that uh, you uh, when they claim you are a United States citizen or a state citizen. They're saying you only have civil rights or civil privileges. And privileges basically comes from the ecclesiastical laws out there. I've, I think I've by the bishops. I think I've developed a, a way of being able to look them up in Anderson pretty quickly. If you get the text version of the dictionary, it has a whole lot of misspellings in it. Uh, and I, I use, I think Notepad will do this, but I, I, I look up in Editpad the word with two blank lines then the word in capitals followed by a period and make sure that it, that's case sensitive. And most of the time it'll go to it unless that, that word is actually misspelled. Then it won't find wow. it. Then you have to look for it. Yeah. Either that or just try and get good at using a scroll bar on the side. Well, I was able to just you can out. quickly go through that dictionary using a scroll bar on the side. Yeah. Okay, and then you. But I, I, the last five words I found, looked up, I've been able to get right to them by doing that method. But yes, yeah, you may have to go at it several ways because there are so many misspellings in there. You have to look at it different ways. I was in Anderson okay. today, and I uh, happened to, I was trying to look up the one of the, the Magnus words, and I run across M-A-N-U-M-I-S-S-O-N. -S -S That's got an interesting definition to that. Manumission? Yep. Uh -huh. I think we addressed that one a uh, year or so ago or something, I think, too. I just happened to run across it. I wasn't with you a year ago. I've only been with you for two weeks, so. Uh, <laughs> I just... Yeah, there's a lot of words that basically I've tried to utilize over the years, and uh, especially with all the documents I sent in uh, to the secretary, and, and I've called him every name under the sun. Well, basically. <laughs> 
I'm still here. There's that Patrick coming again, huh? Well, well, if you go into Oxford Universal Dictionary and look up Magnus, okay, M-A-G-U-S, basically it talks about uh, them being the saucers or sorcerers or whatever, uh, the uh, items out here of the magicians. And basically the one who stood in opposition to them uh, is identified in the Bible or in that dictionary. And it's the one that drove the snakes out of Ireland. St. Patrick. St. Patrick. Mm-hmm. Well, keep driving them out. Right. To Divine Patrick. Thank you very much, okay. Patrick. Okay. Really, we'll talk really to you guys appreciate later. it. You, you, we got an awful lot from you today. Thank you. Okay. It was Thank great. You. Take care. You, you got you got some ink coming for you, Patrick. Yeah. Great. Okay. We'll Thank talk you. To you. Later. Thank you. You take care. Okay. Thank yep. you. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye now.